How about that cigar? How about that cigar? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Drew Estate Cigar Studios for episode 101 mm. of How About That Cigar Live. Thanks so much for joining us, as always, live on Facebook, live on YouTube. And if you're listening after the fact on the audio podcast, thanks so much for spending time with us. Take just a minute right now. If you're live with us, share us out to your favorite Facebook cigar group. Share us mm -hmm. out on YouTube, all mm -hmm. the great social media platforms mm -hmm. out there. Let, mm -hmm. let all your friends know that we are live and we are ready to start the show. And as always, guys, live in the Drew Estate Cigar Studios. And let's remind you once again about the new box designs for the popular Undercrown lines. The new 25 count design is more compact and shelf friendly, enabling premium cigar retailers more shelf space inside their humidors. The new boxes will roll out for all Undercrown lines, including Undercrown Shade, Undercrown Sun Grown, and the original Undercrown Maduro. Finally, and most importantly, all three classic Undercrown blends will remain unchanged. A decade ago, the staff at the Drew Estate Factory realized they had to reduce their consumption of Liga Pravada No. 9 cigars in order to keep up with consumer demand. These hardworking men and women in Esteli then created their own signature cigar to enjoy. Constructed with many of the same rare tobaccos found in Liga Pravada, the Grassroots Undercrown cigar brand debuted, followed by Undercrown Shade and then the Undercrown Sun Grown. The new boxes for Undercrown Shade and Maduro are shipping now with Undercrown Sun Grown soon to follow. For more info, please visit DrewEstate.com. So, episode 101 of How About That Cigar Live. We had a great week off, so thank you guys for uh, for uh, watching again after we took a little bit of a hiatus. It was a vacation for my family and I in Florida. Mm -hmm. Had a great time. Uh, only had heavy rain one day the rest of it was pretty much beautiful that's awesome so it was a good time uh got to see manatees in the canal i saw those videos yeah, and it it, gosh they are so adorable it is really cool to see them back there they and are just adorable so it was cool you know just there was my my in-laws have this place and there's this dock right on the canal and just sat every morning with coffee and a cigar uh and just watch fish jump or manatees or whatever it was it was pretty cool alligators um, getting babies alligators eat eating dogs no i didn't see any no uh, but uh this was really cool so, so a bucket list thing for me um was i'm a big baseball fan and i got mm -hmm. to go to the first time ever i got to go to a spring training game and i got to go with my youngest son eli which was really cool he's 11 years old and uh he was uh he, he he decided it wasn't for him anymore but he did play baseball for a few years and we got to go together to watch uh watch the twins play the orioles in a spring training game had an absolute blast the weather was perfect uh and the the twins actually you know ended up uh it was completely scoreless game for through seven innings and then uh right right then in that final seventh inning um uh, of course i can't remember who it was now that hit the uh um, hit the only run run of the game and uh Wayne Gretzky twin it was Wayne Gretzky totally yes uh, and they yeah the twins won so that was really cool um and we were talking about this a little bit before we went on live on the air is our Minnesota wild are I don't know what's going on I can't explain it they're playing really well right now I'm happy that they're playing well mm -hmm. uh it kind of came out of nowhere because the I kind of don't want to talk about it yeah, because they started out the first week of the season, they were awesome. They and came then, out of the gate. And then they fell apart. They're like, for... we're not going to play right now. <laughs> and we're just going to hang out. Now, all of a sudden, it seems like they're, I don't know, they're finding a rhythm or something, but it's they're really playing well. Uh, they're they are moving up in the division. So anything can happen. You know, it's, uh, it's mm -hmm. sports. That's why they play the games. Mm -hmm. So it's... Uh, and, and then... And then I, I think we're we gonna, can move on to we our. We are going to talk oh. about this last weekend. So I don't think we. No, I think we should just bring in the oh, know. Okay. Uh, our, our buddy. I could mute Risty. your microphone. You know. You could. <laughs> you could. Uh, our buddy Risty from uh, JSK or Jossum Crawl Cigars has a party that he throws every year called Ristafari, and this was year number six for this party. And I, I'm I'm so glad that I got to be a part of you know this is the second time I've gone Matt this is Matt's it was my fourth fourth uh, fourth one fourth time and you guys if you is, add it all up though it's probably only three 
for me. <laughs> but that's all I'm going to say about that. We're smoking some JSK cigars right now. By the uh, way. Uh, just a, a huge shout out to Risty, his family, yeah. his amazing family, and the cigar family down in the uh, Hobart, Indiana and surrounding areas. Um, they're always welcoming to the many outsiders that come for this uh, event every year. Uh, DJ Rod Rodney Dark Knight. Yeah. Ridiculous. Um, all the amazing food, the people, and, you know, just a RIP to all those that died. <laughs> um, nobody in particular. Nobody in particular. Um, but it, 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 oh, Hector, <laughs> you're not wrong. Oh, you are not wrong. I rose from the ashes, bro. I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm good. I'm good. I was not good, but now I am. Yeah. The so. coroner was busy on Saturday <laughs> nights. There yeah. were a lot of people at this this year's Ristafari who uh, fell victim to poor decisions. I may or may not have been one of those people. May or may not. May or may not. Or I cannot confirm or deny. But I just want to give a shout out to Troy, Chris, Rob, um we're gonna miss so many names oh i'm gonna miss a lot of names uh brian uh uh brian brian Bla brian last name yep Stress, uh stessel uh that shaved his head for the that shaves his head every year for the cancer stessel brian yeah. stessel yeah brian stessel uh shaved his head they raised like 2500 dollars for cancer research which is awesome yes um yeah, so many amazing people yeah. that, that we got to meet with, hang out with, throw bags with, and uh, watch. So here's interesting. One quick interesting story is uh, Q, our buddy Q, Quentin Thornation, who is entertaining drunk, by the way, uh, came up to me and asked me if I wanted to be his partner for bags to uh, you know throw bags. Uh, cornhole. Like cornhole, bags, whatever you call it. And I was like, absolutely. I was like, but can you play? Because right at that moment, he was well on his way to Hammertown. Schnockered. And he said, dude, I've got a physics degree. Do you have a physics degree? <laughs> to which I replied, I'm pretty sure my knowledge of physics surpasses yours right now. And I have <laughs> never taken a physics class. Uh, so, yeah, that game didn't go well. Didn't go as, well? No. Um, is it entertaining as he is drunk when he's drunk and he's playing poker? Uh, like we were doing like, you know, 25 cent, 50 cent bets. He, he wouldn't even look at his cards and he'd be like $4. <laughs> so that's the kind of guy he was. And that was fun with no sarcasm there. Um, but all in all, you guys, uh, next year, if you get a chance to Ristafari, it's a great time, great food. Um, it, but the people it's the people and we will always say it we say it over and over again cigar people are the best people amen to that amen to that so thank All you right. guys for a great ristafari let's uh let's bring on our special guests of the evening uh and as always guys you know that special guests on how about that cigar live are brought to you by Corona Cigar Company and CoronaCigar.com, the Internet's largest and easiest to use virtual cigar store. Corona Cigar Company offers you the finest handmade cigars, humidors, and cigar accessories at the absolute lowest possible price. You'll also find unique and limited cigars containing Florida sun-grown tobacco. As a proud American, president and founder of Corona Cigar Company, Jeff Borshowitz believed it was possible to bring cigar tobacco farming back to Florida. At Corona Cigar Company and CoronaCigar.com, you'll find the best selection anywhere in the world of cigars containing this special Florida sun-grown tobacco. If you live in Florida or are just visiting, be sure to visit any of the great Corona Cigar locations in downtown Orlando, Sand Lake, Lake Mary, and also the Davidoff of Geneva Lounge in Tampa. For more info on all of that, please visit coronacigar.com and floridasungrown.com. So ladies and gentlemen, if you would please welcome to episode 101 of How About That Cigar Live from the Premium Cigar Association, Josh Haberski and Scott Pierce. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Hey, gentlemen. Thank you very much for having us. We appreciate it. It's good to see you guys again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, great it's, to have you back. It's second appearance for Scott and first appearance for Josh. Josh, I know it's already lived up to your fullest expectations. Hey, I'm excited for you. We were talking hockey in the green room. I'm, I'm excited. 
We're definitely yeah. going to have a good time tonight. <laughs> well, I know a lot of people are probably familiar with Scott and what he does for the PCA. Um, and we'll get to that later. But Josh, I'd like to, to introduce you to the group and let the viewers and listeners know what you do. Why are you here? Why are you here? What would you say <laughs> you, do, you do here? That's where I was going with that. That was awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. We're getting existential now. Yeah. yeah. So I, I joined the association about two years ago. Um, I am the head of government affairs for the Premium Cigar Association. So the chief lobbyist um, representing, you know, our brick and mortar retailers, associate member manufacturers and consumers on Capitol Hill from the halls of Congress to the Food and Drug Administration, to the White House, to state legislatures, working with our, our team and, um, you know, fighting all the, the smoking bans and advancing the premium cigar culture before policymakers to ensure that we can continue this cherished pastime. Um, I know it's a passion I tell in every broadcast that I do that I'm a consumer first and foremost. I started as a consumer and um, I have my dream job rating right now because I have a personal vested interest in fighting every day for uh, cigar enthusiasts across the country and um, really blessed to, to have this role and be able to do programs like this. I also give you guys a, a shout out. I'm a big fan of uh, all the cigar media out there uh, and for giving us a platform to share our message with consumers across the country to get them involved uh, so that we can continue to enjoy cigars. Oh yeah, absolutely. And so we know that uh, for Scott, we know that uh, because you're in your your uh, your living room or family room there, you you can't enjoy a cigar with us right now. But I know you made a lovely cocktail before we went live. So tell us. Yes. What so this is called a homestead. So I got a shaker and spoon subscription for my wife for Father's Day last year. And uh, so this one that came uh, was eagerly waiting because it was the rye box. And so it came with some ingredients to make. Uh, I love old fashions. I make my own simple syrup and I make old fashions almost on a daily basis. Um, in fact, I found a rabbit hole Derringer bourbon that's just delicious. Uh, so they sent me something to make what's called a homestead old fashioned. It's got a winter spiced uh, simple syrup. So it comes with things like cardamom and some pink peppercorn and um, some star anise and then some black pepper bitters and orange bitters. Uh, mix that up. I, I did bourbon tonight instead of the rye whiskey that it called for because I wanted to drink my uh, my rabbit hole. So just did that with a couple of cherries, poured a double in celebration of being back on the show. So oh, cheers. Nice. Cheers. Awesome. And cheers. welcome. Thank you so much. And yeah. go. You Thanks for having me back on, guys. Oh, we're glad to have you back on. Do yes, absolutely. Do the cigar thing. Yeah. I, 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 so, yeah. So, so now we are super grateful um, to have a platform to allow you guys to come and talk and, and do things. But on top of that, we've got even – Another little special treat, uh, Joshua has been a part of a project with another friend of ours. Some of you might know Mr. Luciano from Ace Prime Cigars. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, Joshua, tell us what you're smoking and about this project. So I'm super excited about this. Uh, I had the opportunity this January to go for a week with Luciano uh, to Nicaragua throughout the, the country from Esteli to Jalapa to Granada and, uh, you know, really learn the process of, of what it takes to manufacture cigars uh, from soup to nuts. Uh, I'm grateful for Luciano and Pichardo for teaching me. Um, and I want to be involved in all of the cigar process and learning about it. I took the, uh, you know, Tobacconist University course last year. Uh, I want to really immerse myself in, in all things cigars. And this was kind of the next step of the process of really learning about it uh, and being involved in it. So instead of giving out business cards, which is the boring thing to do in Washington, D.C., um, I really wanted to give a sensory experience for when I meet people. Um, so I talked with Luciano and kind of told him what I traditionally smoke uh, from some of the different brands, some of his brands. And um, he put produced a cigar for me and we made some slight edits to it in, in Nicaragua, mainly size because I, I smoke quicker um, and um, wanted to have a, a, a Churchill cigar for presentation sake. Uh, but I'm smoking, and you heard it here first, the El Politico. 
uh, which mm. is a gift cigar. Uh, so not available in stores, not for sale. Um, if you meet me or, you know, obviously I'm, I'm doing your show, so I'm going to send you guys some when, when the full production of 1500 uh, for our first run is ready to go in about a month. But it's a sweet, earthy, medium plus full bodied cigar, full flavor, uh, lots of salivation with it. You know, we wanted to do something multidimensional. It has old cedar cocoa flavored, um, but really uh, love the love the name. I got to work on the band. We're still finalizing some things with the band, uh, but probably the most exciting thing uh, that I did this year so far. Man, that is that's awesome! What a great story! That's so cool. How fun too! Yeah. Like that. You know, I know Matt has been down to Nicaragua and got to blend a cigar. It's on my bucket list to go and do that. So, Josh, I'm super excited for you. I can't wait to try it. And many thanks for uh, sending those up when when uh, you get a chance. Yeah, absolutely. And cheers to uh, to our good friend. Uh, cheers to Luciano, Luciano. brother. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, he's the best. For for I mean, not just for being a, a super cool guy to hang out and talk with, but also. Yep. Just everything he does for the communities that he serves, and 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 every uh, there, he's got foundations going that are that are just doing a lot of really cool stuff. So you know, I swear, and and we can get into this later too. But if non cigar consumers were to just spend a couple hours meeting cigar people, mm -hmm. yeah, they are the most giving loving amazing people i know i already said it but cigar people are truly the best people um it, it would oh it's just so frustrating sometimes <laughs> the opposition <laughs> that that uh we get into but let's get into the yeah. nuts and bolts of uh, of the show here yeah so um we're gonna the the first thing i want to ask about is a is a trade show question and so we got we, we just got the email uh, with Aaron's Aaron's great about keeping in touch with everybody and communicating well. And we just got the email that registrations are going to be opening soon for the PCA yes. 2021 trade show. Um, and we know regardless whether it's cigars, whatever the business is, the landscape, you know, since this time last year, the landscape for in-person trade shows has has changed so much. So. And it's got to be a struggle for any company or organization who's going to try to put together an in-person trade show. So in your latest discussions with the venues in Las Vegas where it's currently scheduled and, and ready to happen, are things still on track for the 2021 trade show to happen as scheduled? Yes, and they actually have kind of picked up in into more momentum. Um, it, it's been a grueling 90 days trying to work through uh, you know, the politics of D.C. are interesting enough, but the politics of Las Vegas and Nevada take on a whole new uh, face and, and maze of mirrors. Uh, but I will say this. Uh, uh, just a couple of days ago, Governor Sisolak of Nevada, they were on schedule to open up to 50 percent capacity starting May 1st. They've moved that timeline up to, to, to today. So Vegas is now operating at 50 percent capacity. We have been in regular contact with both the Gaming Commission and the Health Department there. Um Pardon me. And I've been working with them on a large event proposal plan, not too dissimilar for what the Vegas Golden Knights had to submit to have start having people in their um, hockey arena starting, uh, I believe it was March 1st, when they started being able to wel welcome people back at 15% capacity. So we've kind of done similar things as we're looking at this uh, because in Nevada in particular, but also I think in most places around the country, you've seen the trends dropping significantly in terms of infections, vaccinations have continued to rise. Uh, and so hospitalizations, et cetera, ha have all trended in the right direction for us to be able to have this event. Um, you know, our, our whole goal was to be able to hold an event that would be pretty much as close to possible as what our previous events have been. And so that means smoking on the show floor. That means meeting with people. That means uh, obviously testing out the new products. Um, so that's all a part of our proposal. And the other good news is that the World of Concrete, which is a massive show, um, they got approval for 50% capacity for their show in June, just a few weeks before ours. That show will welcome about 30,000 plus people to it. So right now we're on, we're on trend in order for us to have the show. Obviously, there's going to be some mitigation stuff that we're going to have in place. But by and large, it's going to be pretty reminiscent from what people have experienced in past shows in terms of 
being able to smoke on the show floor, uh, being able to get new products, being able to talk with the vendors, meet with them and, you know, place the orders as normal. Um, and then also having some of the other festivities that we generally have around the trade show. So that's, it's all, uh, on, on schedule going July 9th through the 13th in good old Las Vegas, Nevada. Okay. And now the, uh, the Sands was recently just purchased. Correct. Does that affect anything at all? Has that been yeah, uh, not go ahead? Yeah, not up, not, not sorry about that. Not up until now. Um, all the only information that we've been given is that they're going to close at some point towards the end of this year to go through a rebrand. It will no longer be called the Sands. It's all going to it's the convention center, I think, at the Venetian. So it's all going to be the Venetian resort in total. They're going to close to kind of do re signage and rebranding for that. Uh, as far as our contract with them and everything else, nothing has changed. Um, and so we're still good. Our contract is very explicit in the fact that we have to have smoking on the show floor. We have to have smoking rooms uh, so that anybody who comes to our event and gets a room, they can choose to an elect. They, we have a certain number of smoking rooms available. So you can enjoy cigars back in your room because you're not going to be able to smoke all of them on the show floor. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and Josh, one of the things I wanted to learn a little bit about you um in addition to some more specific legislative questions we have later is um you know you being being with the pca uh, and and um you know functioning in the role you know the lobbyist role you i would assume you know other other lobbyists in other in other uh uh types of business and things like that different different uh different areas and everything obviously since since a year ago now has changed. So how has the lobbying landscape as a whole changed and uh, specifically kind of what, what does the day in the life look like for you, uh, you know, pre COVID and now? Absolutely. And it's, it's interesting because um, you know, there were a few of us that came together in other industries and wrote an ebook on virtual advocacy and lobbying. Uh, so I, I co-authored that um, with a few folks in other trade associations, trying to figure out, you know, how do we operate in the new norm? And um, not only do you have COVID, but the events of January 6th, you know, the U.S. Capitol right now, which I'm, I'm steps away from, is boarded up with barbed wire and National Guard's troops. So you physically can't get into the U.S. Capitol unless you are escorted by a staff member or a member of Congress. So a lot of it has shifted to virtual meetings. Um, and for a small association such as PCA, that has actually been uh, beneficial. Um, we really looked at the, the glass half full rather than half empty and put together a lot of virtual meetings. We still did 150 congressional visits last year. Um, early in the year, we were at the White House working on substantial uh, equivalents and some of the other things with the Food and Drug Administration, but we continued when things shifted over to COVID. Um, you know, you, you all were probably on our email list getting, you know, almost daily updates in the onset of COVID of how do you operate. You know, we put, put, produced health and sanitation guides for our retail members and really wanted to be forward facing, uh, trying to get the resources to the small business owners as quick as possible. Um, now, you know, some of the stuff has gotten back to normal. We still have small scale events. Um, you know, we help, had uh, an event last October with 100 people uh, here in Arlington, Virginia, outside. So as spring comes and summer comes, we're hoping to have more of those uh, educational meetings uh, with a new Congress and new administration. We're now pivoting and, and educating folks. You would not believe how many people don't know what a premium cigar is, never have smoked a cigar, never been around a, a premium cigar. So a lot of it is that initial outreach. We had you know, turnover in Congress. We have to get in front of all those new offices, the new political appointees for the administration to continue the agenda. Um, you know, Right now with the makeup of Congress being so evenly split, you know, 50 50 in, in the Senate, Democratic to Republican, and a very thin margin uh, of Democratic control in the House of Representatives. We're um, in a good position to insert our issue to the forefront, educate folks, 
and um, also stave off a lot of problems federally. The battlefield right now has shifted a lot to the states, which I know we'll talk a little bit later, but uh, I would say about 50% of my time right now is working with Glenn Loop and Ryan Parada, our research assistant, on state efforts, working with state associations, and really getting them the resources they need to fight OTP taxes, smoking bans, and other restrictions. Okay. And if, uh, sorry, Josh, if we could go back just a little bit and talk about um, your position, and if you wouldn't mind, you know, what qualifies you to be a lobbyist for, uh, you know, cigar consumers, retailers, and in the industry in general? For he sure. Sold soul. <laughs> <laughs> didn't we, didn't we all? <laughs> No, I, so I've uh, I've spent a decade lobbying. I started with the American Motorcyclist Association, uh, did a stint in public health with the American Diabetes Association, and really earned my stripes with the Independent Community Bankers of America, where we were involved with Dodd Frank rollbacks. Mm. Uh, we were successful at that. I also set up a grassroots consultancy. Grassroots was my specialty. I've written over a hundred articles in that. Uh, teach at George Washington University in the graduate school, a course on state advocacy. Um, so that, that's that been my specialty area and had the opportunity to work with Scott and Dan Trope at the time, uh, who was my predecessor, um, for a year before coming into the role as the director of federal affairs and then eventually the head of government affairs uh, controlling it all, but uh, have worked and won you know, national ac accolades, for successful advocacy campaigns. And uh, for me, again, it was really marrying the two, my background in, in government affairs. I, I have a, a master's from Georgetown in government um, and um, you know the education and experience, but now I have the passion. I wasn't a motorcycle rioter, um, you know, wasn't a community bank owner, didn't have uh, diabetes, fortunately. So now this is the first you know, project that I really can put 150% in because uh, as Scott knows, I, I enjoy cigars and I'm one of the outliers in terms of the overall statistics in terms of consumption. So I, I you guys are probably old enough to remember uh, Doogie Hauser. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Josh is the Doogie Hauser of lobbying. <laughs> I think Josh was consulting on political campaigns when he was like 12 uh, maybe 15 or so. Um, but yeah, wow. but Josh is, uh, no, Josh is, uh, Josh is a rare breeze. He's, uh, he's very good at what he does and, uh, he's a lobbyist with integrity, but I like first and foremost, Josh just, he just loves cigars. He yeah. just loves cigars and that makes him even more effective at his job. He's not just a hired gun. Um, I mean, obviously he took his a trip down to Nicaragua on his own dime to go make his own cigars and learn more about the process. That should tell you everything you know, need to know about him and his love for this industry. Yeah. And I think, I think that's important for, uh, for the people that are, um, that are involved in this fight. Cause honestly, I think, like we said before we went live, I think it helps us all just understand the culture that we're fighting for yeah. so much yeah. more. And it can help us convey that to non cigar users, you know, and, and, and just help, help us to convey that message about, that it's not, it's, you know, it's, it's not a nicotine delivery device. It's not an addictive, right. product, that kind of thing. So, uh, and I think having the passion for the culture, um, is, is definitely important. I think it's paramount. Yeah. 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 You know, and I think, you know, setting out in, in 2021, obviously 2020 was a difficult year, but Scott and I wanted to make the most of it and we're able to visit 50 retailers, um, in 2020, my goal for this year is between 75 and 100. Um, I want the feedback. I want to know what are the pain points for the retailers uh, that they're facing and the consumers. And a lot of times impromptu, I'll walk into a shop, you know, introduce myself to the, the employees or the owner and we'll do a, you know, whoever's in the lounge and we'll talk about the legislation of the day and the regulations of the day and get feedback. You know, a lot of the times campaigns that we're running at PCA come from 
feedback, whether it's positive or negative. Um, you know, I put my phone number and my email address everywhere. We want to hear from folks of how we can help. And there's a, a, a ton of challenges out there from local, state and federal. Um, you know, we'll get into some of the issues now, but I feel for the folks in, in Michigan right now, we're working to resolve the situation there and in parts of, of Maryland um, to get lounges reopened. But, um, you know, we'll, we'll continue to fight and we're, we're growing the army. Uh, this year, we've already had more grassroots actions uh, in the past, you know, two plus months than we did all of last year combined. So it, we're, we're heading in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Scott, going back to the um, the trade show, when you um, like you said, you've you're in regular communications with uh, with the venue and with, uh, you know, state and city departments and things like that to make sure everything's lined up. One of the things I'm curious about is I would have to imagine that there are going to be some at this year's PCA there, there are going to be some things that that uh, that look and feel and and just are mechanically a little bit different than previous trade shows. So what are some of the 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 major restrictions that the venue or the state or the city are saying that are going to be the restrictions that will be in place that maybe haven't been in place previously? Yeah, you know, that's a that's a, a question we ask on a pretty much daily basis. The challenge that they have is that they still are unaware of that themselves in a lot of ways, uh, especially because our event is in July. And what's going to happen is if everything continues, which all signs point to it this way, said if everything continues in the trends downward, as we've seen in terms of infections, hospitalizations, et cetera, on May 1st, the control, I guess is the way, best way to put it, but as far as like the overall restrictions and guidelines and everything else at a state level, revert to the counties and the counties then um, and, and more localities as far as Nevada is concerned. And so with the county, et, et cetera, being kind of involved very much so in Las Vegas with the convention industry, there will be a little bit more of an adjustment and probably a little bit more of an easement of some of those restrictions. I can tell you right now what it looks like are things like partitions, some plexiglass when you're in, and staggered registration times. One of the changes that we know we will have for our show, definitely, because it's too hard for us to try to change this midstream, you know, six weeks before the trade show. But registration is going to be in a different area. We're fortunate that we have a very large convention space. And so it's pretty easy for us to be able to kind of widen this, widen some things out in order to meet some specifications so that people aren't cramped in aisles and things like that. So it's, it's little things like that right now that they're talking about. Obviously, they talk about masks being on if, you know, you're not eating or drinking. Or in our case, we're very specific, smoking a cigar. Um, so that's all part of our proposal. So unless by some bizarre, you know, instance of some overzealous person uh, in some sort of oversight committee somewhere with any kind of authority wants to insert him or herself into this, uh, we've been given every indication that our show should be able to go on as usual with just, look, we're going to have extra sanitation. We're going to have some extra medical officers on, on site and things like that. Um, some partitions off during registration areas and some of those other things, but we don't anticipate really severe restrictions as most people have been used to going out and about and starting to see those things. When you were just in Florida, probably imagine maybe a little bit more towards that feel than maybe what you're currently experiencing in some of these other places. Okay. And uh, real quick, I want to get some more people watching and listening to this show. So um, I'm going to give away a uh, five pack of cigars to two lucky people who share this show. If, uh, if you share this out, you'll be in the running for a five pack of cigars. It's important to us to get this information. This might not be the most exciting show. I get that, but it's an important show <laughs> because you're going to no get, offense, no <laughs> offense. You know, <laughs> I you get know, it. I get it. I'm, I'm just calling it like it is, you know, um, oh, sure. Yeah. This is the important information that we as consumers need to know and need to hear and need to talk about. So if you share it out, uh, you'll be in the running for a five pack. 
Awesome. Too. Yeah, share it out. And, and also for consumers to understand, guys, I mean, the, the trade show is where, by and large, for the most part, most of the manufacturers will release their new products where they share them with the retailers. So the retailers go and they get to taste the new products. They get to talk with the manufacturers about stuff that's coming up, planning, you know, new release schedules and things like that and events at their shops for you guys to all attend, too. So that's kind of, I think, a little bit down to the trickle down for the, the trade show about how it impacts you all as consumers. So... Um, for uh, this is kind of a, a general fund question, uh, probably maybe more for Josh, maybe more for Scott. I really don't know. You guys take it as, as you hear it, but from a funds perspective from, from, and, and it, we don't have to get into the, the nickels and dimes, but just from a general basic percentages standpoint, as far as the funds that the PCA takes in the there's a percentage that comes in from retail partners there's a percentage that comes in from manufacturers there's a percentage that comes in from media percentage that comes in from from other sources so kind of how does that in the in the basic sense how do those percentages break down as far as the total funds that come into the pca each year sure i uh i'll try to do this as sort of a bro as broad as possible not to get too far into the details the pca is a trade association and really up until about 12 10 years ago, uh, really focused on, on the trade show. Um, and the trade show is what brings in the most amount of money to the association. Um, really, uh, in about 10 years ago, I bring that up is that's when the Tobacco Control Act passed and when cigar started to enter into this really murky, unsavory world of, of regulation slash overregulation and, and regulatory overreach. And that's when the, the, at then the IPCP, IPCPR uh, started to change and say, look, we need to get involved in advocacy and, and, and be more proactive in the defense of our industry. Uh, so at that time, uh, you know, it, when you normally have a trade association, the dues make up uh, a pretty large share, uh, oftentimes the largest share of where you get a lot of your revenues. Um, the PCA, uh, traditionally, those membership dues have really just been tied to a ticket to the trade show. So they haven't been uh, nominally very high. Uh, they did do a little bit of a raise a couple of years ago. Um, and so when you're looking at percentages of those membership dues, the retailer dues uh, is is roughly uh, when you're looking just at the straight uh, dues amounts, retailers make up about 40 some odd percent, manufacturers make up about 35, 40 percent, uh, and then the other 20 percent are coming from media and then industry partners like distributors, suppliers and brokers. Okay, that's and, and that's good to just kind of know those basics, I think. Uh, it's that, probably, I'm sorry. It's a little higher retail, maybe 45 to 35 of uh, dues comparatively to to manufacturers. But the manufacturers, obviously, um, well, you know, the, their money they spend at the trade show, uh, at least on their booth fees, is is what PCA makes. Okay. Um, so, kind of getting into some of the some of the state specific things because us here, and we'll start with Minnesota because Garrett and I are based here in Minnesota and. Minnesota was actually one of the, and I, I, I'm sorry if I don't remember exactly right, if it was four years ago, somewhere in that neighborhood, that Minnesota was one of the rare bright spots. There was a, there was, it, it's very rare that you see a tax uh, eliminated or reduced by a, by a vast amount. And Minnesota had a horribly high uh, tax cap on premium hand rolled cigars. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, the, the, the fantastic news came along that that cap was going to be reduced down to a 50 cent cap, which really made a lot of uh, cigar smokers happy, but especially in Minnesota, because there, there really aren't a ton of cigar st uh, shops in the state of Minnesota, but the people who run those shops and the people who uh, uh, are consumers at those shops are extremely dedicated people and you know seeing so many shops wondering if they were going to be able to stay in business with these high taxes and then all of a sudden seeing that tax go down was a great victory but then uh recently there was uh you know there was a reintroduction of uh of a potential bill to uh jump that that uh, tax cap all the way back up to to where it used to be mm -hmm. uh so Josh, give us uh, give us the lowdown on what that was about and where it stands right now. Absolutely. So, you know, this is a bit of an outlier bill. Um, currently in Minnesota, the tax cap is 50 cents a cigar. Uh, the representative uh, Jennifer Schultz introduced a bill that would increase that tax cap to 
$5 a cigar or 97% wholesale price, the lesser of the two values, which would make this bill, um, it would make Minnesota have the highest tax on premium cigars in the nation. Um, we have been working behind the scenes. There are several cigar um, allies within the legislature in Minnesota, uh, Representative Jim Nash being one of them. Um, we have uh, a confirmation that this bill is not going anywhere. Um, you know, it, it went out of committee in the health committee, uh, but, you know, we, ha we have enough to block it within the Senate. Um, that, that that this shouldn't be an issue. It shouldn't be a, a, a concern uh, for for those uh, retailers. But we still have to do our due diligence. We can't. All right, ignore it. It's it's not going to go through. Uh, if you go to www.cigaraction.org, we have an alert set up where you can write. Anyone in Minnesota can write to their state representatives and state senators. It takes thirty seconds. Name, email address, address. And you can send it. Um, yeah, so uh, I would our research, our research associate Ram Prada has posted it in the comments. So yep. you can just click that link right there and go to it. Uh, what's great is that we've had the opportunity now to have tax caps in several states, and that information that rolls in, we're now able to use in these state legislatures to say, look, if your goal is to try to capture as much tax revenue as possible, keeping the tax cap at fifty cents will bring in more money then raising the price. Exactly. Right? And it's just, it's a simple, it's a simple business model, right? The long tail versus the short tail. Long tail is it's cheaper. You're going to get a lot more people buying cigars because people who are going to buy cigars, if they're 10, $15 more expensive in Minnesota, they're going to get them elsewhere and you're not going to get that tax revenue. Yeah. Well, and it's, I, I've said this before and I'm not an expert. I just say this based on a layman's perspective, but it, in my perspective, most legislation is written in a, it, it's written very lazily. They don't, they don't really pay attention to yeah. specifics about the, you know, they, they, uh, in our case, they take the word tobacco and they just lump everything together. It's very lazy to not mm -hmm. actually dig into the different types of tobacco products and things like that. And I understand they're very busy people, but, but from a consumer perspective, whether it's tobacco legislation or other types of legislation that I potentially disagree with, it always seems like legislation is written in a very lazy kind of way. That's and being Matt, nice. And Matt, I was I was say, that's saying, being nice because <laughs> honestly, I'll give you my perspective. I'll let Josh give you the, the, the wonky insider perspective. From my perspective, the, the, the more vague they can keep it, the better because it allows them a lot more room to be yeah. able to maneuver the way that they want to be able to maneuver in case they need it. They don't ever want to paint themselves into any kind of corner when writing legislation. The other part is, is that you generally have nothing against young kids, but you generally have the young kids writing the legislation who were the legislative aides or directors for these, uh, this congressman or, or congresswoman and senators, et cetera. And so they don't have any nuance when it, in, in perspective when it comes to writing these things. Right. The only experience that this 22, 23 year old might've had with tobacco is, the anti-tobacco, you know, uh, anti-smoking campaigns that is put out by the federal government. And so they think, yeah, man, let's 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 tax tobacco into oblivion because it's bad. It's cigarettes. It kills. Right. It killed grandma right. Ma with lung cancer and right. that kind of stuff. That's my perspective. I'll let Josh give you the insider wonky perspective. Well, and, and I think that you're absolutely spot on, Scott and Matt. I, I, you know, you look at it across the board. The biggest challenge that our industry has faced in the past two years has been differentiating ourselves away from e-cigarettes and vapor products. Most of the state level and local level bills, and even to the extent at the federal level, has targeted e-cigarette consumption by youth. Well, it was important last January that the Food and Drug Administration acknowledge that premium cigars are the lowest enforcement priority. We have negligible negligible youth access issues. So that's where we start the conversation with a lot of these elected officials and, and regulators. And many of them are not aware of it. We're an afterthought in most of these conversations that are about e-cigarettes, vapor products, or even combustible cigarettes. So we have to get our foot in the door and assert those arguments uh, from the onset. Um, Scott mentioned some great research that uh, Ryan, our uh, research assistant, has put together working with Glenn Loop, our, our state advisor. 
Um, we're fighting for tax caps, the preservation of tax caps in certain states. Um, last week, you saw the, the release in Michigan uh, that we're fighting to preserve that cap. Um, also in New York, um, I think that's really important because the New York Tobacconist Association is doing a great job. Uh, Glenn is on weekly meetings with them. We're educating policymakers about that. If you are the state government and you want to raise more revenue, it's better to have a tax cap because folks will then um, go elsewhere. They will go to other states. You know, if you're in upstate New York, why wouldn't you go to Pennsylvania when you can pay significantly less for a product because there's no OTP tax? Or if you're in, you know, Florida uh, or online. So, you know, the, the consumers are savvy. They're going to go where the cheaper product um, is available. And uh, we need to do a good job in, in ensuring that there's a, you know, level playing field or fair playing field where people can buy local. They can support their local brick and mortar shops. Um, to enjoy their cigars and their lounges. So, you know, in addition to the tax cap measures, we're also fighting hard this legislative cycle. And I believe we're up to five bills where you could enjoy premium cigars with adult beverages. Uh, so cigar bar legislation, Montana, yeah. North Dakota, Maine. Um, Minnesota. Because it adds another revenue element where yeah can sustain and coming off of COVID and the, some of the shutdowns in the most restrictive states, it's important to uh, provide those revenue streams and, and sources for our members. Yeah. Cause it's very, it was very, you know, it, strange for me being in Florida the last couple of weeks to go into a cigar bar. I went, uh, it was in the Fort Myers area. I went to world famous cigar bar there and to be able to walk into a humidor, pick out a handful of cigars, Go pay for them and then sit down and order a gin and tonic, light up a cigar. You can't do that here in Minnesota. Yeah. And it's, it's very disappointing to, especially in Minnesota with the with the 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 weather swings we have here when you when it's 20 degrees below zero out. Most guys, most yeah. most women who are cigar smokers, we don't have lounges in our house. We don't have a heated garage where we can we're lucky enough here in the studio that we do, but but most people don't have that. So the cigar lounges are where they go to enjoy their cigars. And and to think that they can't just sit down and have a cocktail and a cigar at the same time is senseless to me. It is, there's no there's no reason for it. And, and these are age verified locations. If you right. need to prevent youth access, provide cigar bars where adults, legal adults can buy legal products. And, um, you know, that's something that we're continuously fighting for. And um, I expect that we're going to get some passage of, um, you know, at least one or two of those bills this session where you'll see some new cigar bars. And it, it's important. We ran the numbers last year, despite the challenges to the retail sector in 2020. And, you know, you know, in other retail areas, they were extremely hard hit restaurants, premium cigar tobacconists, lounges. There was a net positive, more stores open last year than closed. And that to me right there is a telling tale of the resiliency of the industry and this community that we all know and love. Yeah. yeah and the cons and the consumers and their dedication yeah. to it as well. I like to joke going back a little bit though, about the youth access and, and, you know, so I understand when, when, you know, you're trying to restrict youth access to the nicotine delivery uh, systems, the ends devices, right? electronic nicotine delivery systems it, it's it's interesting because uh, you know we want we want to make sure we don't create addicts that they're rushing outside in freezing cold weather to try to suck in some nicotine because they're addicted to it like what 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 are you afraid of with, with the you know i would say young person let's just say you know you're 21 years old you're going to get a sophisticated person who enjoys the nuance of this and who's going to understand terroir and and weather patterns and how it relates to something and they're going to become enthralled with the hobby and enjoy the finer things in life and going to be a little bit more educated and they're going to i mean what are you afraid of creating there somebody that that's a little bit more you know sophisticated in in their hobbyist pursuits or you know this isn't an addiction it's a i mean well i mean i guess a lot of our significant others might think it's that but i mean 
it's 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 this it's this passionate cultural pursuit that we all enjoy and that's there's i mean that's the only danger that you have with somebody that starts to smoke this uh, you know at a younger age i'll say and i'm not saying underage but you know they're going to end up with a pocket square being a policy wonk teaching graduate programs and lobbying on you know capitol hill i mean that's the danger is you're going to create fine upstanding citizens like josh <laughs> that pocket square game is on point that is right look at that um, thing but I want to, so I, I spoke with many uh, lounge owners and uh, specifically in Michigan right now, there's a lounge owner that is struggling uh, with what's going on up there. And yeah, I hear you guys talk about, you know, we're fighting, we're fighting, but what does that really look like? What does it look like to be, be fighting this legislation um, when, you know, you hear these bills uh, we don't doubt that you're fighting, but what does that mechanism truly look like? Where do those dollars go? And, you know, how, how is that? What does that fight look like? Generally, for me, what I would like it to mean is that sort of me in in sort of like a, a wrestling onesie greased up in Crisco on the Capitol steps, <laughs> sort of screaming at the top of my lungs. Um, that that to me, hopefully presents somewhat of a, of a fearsome picture. Uh, but really a lot of, uh, there's Luciano with it. I don't know if your ears were burning Luciano, but we were saying uh, all kinds of great things about you. Josh is smoking the political right now. So I um, hope you're doing well, friend. Uh, so fighting really what that means is a multifaceted, multi-pronged approach that we like to employ. Um, and for us, it's not about spraying and praying um, and a shotgun, it's really deploying many surgical aspects of how we have to approach this, right? We know we're a niche industry, we're smaller, so we have to be much smarter in how we approach things. And so we're very direct in how we go about it. We like to employ, uh, obviously, a loud voice and, and really trying to get that grassroots implementation out there of getting as many people to pepper elected officials and, and policymakers at the same time as Josh talked a little bit about earlier with some of the other uh, legislatures, working behind the scenes with people that we can make connections. So in terms of dollars, we a lot oftentimes will either employ a, a state lobbyist who is very well connected and knows how to get the meetings that we need in order to talk to the right people. Uh, it means setting up meetings, having those, educating them. Uh, but as much as we possibly can, it's also enlisting so many of the retailers and the consumers with the tool like CigarAction.org, uh, again, which isn't free, which we pay for. But it's it's a great tool for us to be able to get hundreds, if not thousands of letters peppering elected officials. A great case study in success was a New Jersey bill that came down a little while ago that was going to require anybody that sold any kind of tobacco product to sell tobacco cessation products. So if you were a premium cigar retailer and all you sold were premium cigars and some pipes and pipe tobacco, you were required to have nicotine gum, for example, which is asinine and completely bereft of any understanding of this industry, right? Mm -hmm. Well, within probably 24 hours of us hearing about that, we had a campaign going and hundreds and hundreds of letters hit that sponsoring senator of that bill. And Josh was on the phone with them. I, correct me if I'm wrong, Josh, but they were like, yeah. We have never in the history, in 15 years of doing this, we have never gotten so many letters so fast on a piece of policy. And it killed it like that. And they changed it and made special concessions and carved premium cigars out, understanding that that's not what they were going after. It was like going after 7-Eleven and gas stations. So yeah. Josh can speak a little bit more about the specifics in, in, in that approach. But that's that's the sort of the, the general game plan about how we attack and how we fight. And before you, uh, I, I also just want to, tack on to my question, you know, out of the, the six different shop owners that I talked to, only one received any communication from the PCA about legislation. What are we, um, you know, what is the PCA doing to communicate to not only the, you know, the consumers, but specifically the, the lounge owners, um, yeah, about so the fight. I'll, yeah, I'll so that's when the um, I, I think Michigan in, in terms of the there's a, a certainly a case study there. And um, we first and foremost want to make sure that we're working with our local and state partners. So most of my communication has been with Andy Hyde, the president of the Michigan uh, Retailers Association. He's the one that we're working directly with. 
Um, you know, the, the folks in Michigan are the ones that have the personal story. Uh, so what we did in this instance, we wrote a letter, um, you know, weeks ago, three weeks ago, um, opposing the, the governors and the Secretary of Health and Human Services in Michigan, the closure of the lounge lounges based off of the interpretation of the mask policy. So we sent the letter, requested a meeting with the Secretary of Health and Human Services, which took place uh, two weeks ago. And uh, we convened as PCA, brought everybody together. Andy presented on behalf of the Michigan retailers. Uh, we deployed and through uh, shared cost, PCA and the Michigan retailers um, got a local lobbyist, as um, Scott mentioned, Dave Jessup, who's been on the ground working on this. Uh, he's really the lead uh, person on this, but we presented our case in a 45 minute meeting uh, to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, provided follow up information on air filtration and ventilation in cigar lounges, uh, which was important to them. And uh, I got notice today that uh, Friday, there will be a new policy that's coming out, uh, which will affect Michigan cigar retailers uh, for the better, you know, that they can open their lounges up based off of some qualifiers. So that will be coming out Friday. But, um, you know, for, for the folks that are um, PCA members, they will receive our action alerts. Um, that prompt them to write to the elected officials. In this case, it's a, a regulatory action. So they're not as involved in, in that process. We're working with the principals and they will receive information from the Michigan Association. So we're tracking everything at a global scale. So I looked at and researched 1800 pieces of legislation uh, thus far this year. We have highlighted about 100 of them and 40 of them we've taken a stance or position where we've launched a grassroots campaign. So it kind of is, it filters down. We get the information, we work with the state association because we don't wanna cross and take a different position that they, than they have. So that's, that's an important approach that we, we've implemented. And I would just say real quick on that, if there are retailers in, in some of these states and they haven't seen anything come out from us, uh, chances are they probably haven't um, joined or paid dues or been on, on our in our database um, in within like the last five years or so. If that's the case, reach out to us. Let us know. We can put you on on the list. Uh, ideally, uh, you know, they'd be a dues paying member uh, for every for every dues dollar that comes in for a retailer. We spend at least five of that in advocacy efforts. Um, and so I know that people like to think that that their their retailer dues are just a ticket to the trade show, but in reality, their dues are spent um, in, in the defense of their shops uh, in that regard. And so, um, so that's kind of my, my pitch to retailers is that by doing that, you'll get all of our action alerts at the same time. You're, you're being a part of the fight yourselves. And 2,500 people took action so far in, in Michigan about reopening. And that's a, yeah. an amalgamation of, of, uh, retailers, consumers, and manufacturers. Yeah. So if I'm, you know, this is how it looks to an outsider who is not familiar with a lot of how this process looks. You've got uh, a politician who has constituents that see all tobacco is wrong. Politically, uh, voting against uh, a tobacco law may be political suicide for some of these guys and gals. Where is the loud voice that convinces some of these lawmakers to really uh, stand up to that? How does that, um, you know, how do the letters and the voices start to change minds and policy? Well, it goes back to a lot of what you were saying earlier. As you say, it goes back to all of what you were saying earlier. You know, if we have a, a bunch of cigar smokers that they have friends that don't smoke, they have family members that don't smoke, but they understand my love and appreciation for cigars. So for them, they're not going to step up and, and be a passionate opponent, right? They're not going to buy into the anti-smoking agenda. Uh, the more we can do that, the better. Um, and, and the more that we're able to reach out. And, and the other part, too, is, is that we're able to draw a pretty interesting distinction, as Josh mentioned earlier, away from what the true target is, right? For, for years and years and years and years, premium cigars were never really on the regulatory target list. 
it became so just because of really honestly somewhat of an accident of the Tobacco Control Act that even one of the authors of that bill was said, hey, premium cigars were never intended to be a part of this. But we're, we're here now when there's really no putting that toothpaste back in the tube as far as that's concerned, um, regulatorily speaking. So, so for us, that's what it's a part of. But the other part is what Josh just mentioned. 2,500 letters is a lot because here's what local politicians are going to respond to. They might understand and think that there is some sort of faceless monolith that, that exists out there that's going to come bearing down on them for some sort of particular passion topic like tobacco. But if you have 2,500 individuals, many of whom are, are business owners who pay business taxes, who employ people who pay taxes, who have family members who depend on those paychecks, um, that, and then that can, continues to snowball. You have consumers who are also on their own rights, members of every community, taxpayers voting. They, they vote, right? Some of them might also be business owners. It impacts that community at large. That's what they're, they're going to respond to. And so by us being able to provide a mechanism for you all to have your voices heard and land on the ears that they need to land on gives us a megaphone and a multiplier effect in that regard. And that's really what kind of how we want to work with our state associations in order to have that multi-pronged approach to really amplify the voices of all three of those tiers involved with that. And Josh, you can expound upon that probably in more detail. Well, and I think, you know, it's a combination of using health data as well as small business data. There's 30,000 retail employees in the premium cigar industry in the United States, 120,000 employees in secondary and tertiary sectors. That's not a, accounting for all the hundreds of thousands of people employed in this industry in places like Nicaragua, the Dominican Republic and Honduras and other countries. So, you know, there is a, a depth and volume to this industry um, where people are have a vested interest into it. And behind all of those letters and those petitions and even social media posts, um, there's a voice behind that with a personal story. And that's what we have to do is capture that and provide the right communication channels. I tee up legislation and fight against bad legislation. But if we're going to be successful, that personal story and that element has to be at the forefront. So we're never going to be successful if we don't have people that are in this industry, retailers, consumers and, and manufacturers involved in that process. So, you know, I, I like to think of it. We're, we're, we're playing football. You know, we have to have our, our quarterbacks, which are the, are the association, and, but we're working with folks to call the right plays at the right time and, um, you know, really advance the ball forward. Okay. Um, and, and so some of this, as I think about it, it comes down to, because we have a lot of uh, friends, honestly, around the country who are shop owners, uh, and some of them are uh, dues paying PCA members, some are not. Um, and when it comes to stuff like Michigan or, or Minnesota and many other States that are having, uh, different types of bans or tax increases and things like that, what, what specifically does. So, so when you guys reach out to shops, do you, do you, uh, compile and, and, and build, action plans and advice for those shops on on exactly what to say and how to how to approach the legislators and things like that and in order for them to get that information uh, is is it pretty much in the cards that they've got to be uh they've got to be a dues paying pca member to get that advice and that help no no, no. on countless occasions we've helped folks that aren't dues paying members you know cigar action for the outward facing is a free resource. It's something that the association pays for. That's, you know, principally for employees, retailers, and consumers uh, to utilize. But we've set up meetings for folks. Uh, a lot of times they will work in, in some type of advocacy project with us. And we've seen people join the association as a result of that. But we prepare them for the meeting. You know, it can be intimidating. I remember you know, over a decade ago, my first meeting in the Capitol, the marble floors and the statues, it is very intimidating for folks that aren't uh, involved in it. But with 
the virtual advocacy component, going back to your earlier point, the barrier of entry is a lot lower than it used to be. You don't have to pay for a plane ticket and a hotel to come to Washington, D.C. or your state capitol. If you want to meet with your elected official, and I say this across to any listeners, whether you're a consumer, manufacturer, retailer, we'll work to set up a meeting with your elected officials. As it relates to retailers, which, you know, that's our, our principal membership, um, we, we are facilitating those conversations constantly, you know, for our fly in, we'll bring in, you know, 20 retailers set up all their meetings. So they go from office to office to office. Uh, August recess is another great time. I've done a lot of uh, in store visits with members of Congress where they can actually see the sensory experience where they can see as people are purchasing their cigars. Hey, you know, the average person's, you know, over 30 years old purchasing these cigars, the age verification process. We want to create that sensory experience. And we also want to create uh, a, a, a connection with the retailer where they're the go-to resource for these elected officials. So when something tobacco related comes up and it may not even be premium cigar related, they're calling their premium tobacconist saying, hey, what should my stance be on this? Can you educate me? But on Cigar Action, we have policy resources. We have one pagers, how to explain it. We have what is advocacy, soup to nuts. And we did, I think, 10 trainings, regional trainings last year through Zoom calls, educating the state associations so that they can filter down and also teach people. So, you know, we try to get the most, most uh, bang for our buck. Our resources are limited. But you've seen this year an outpouring of support for advocacy purposes, the manufacturers stepping up and donating, um, you know, not just mo monetarily with their time, talents and, and treasure. And I think that that's important for us to continue that um, despite the challenges with COVID and um, everything that transpired in 2020. Just to piggyback on that just uh, real quickly here is that, no, look, if you're not a dues paying member, and you've got something that comes down or whatever, you know, we're going to help. We're going to do everything that we can. Uh, understanding, of course, that, you know, limited staff, limited budget, but we'll do what we can because that's what we're here for. We're here for the industry. Um, I would also just ask, you know, kind of realize that if advocacy is a benefit that you get um, from the PCA, regardless if you pay any dues. But at the same time, when you've got, you know, people like Pete Johnson donating $10,000 and Eddie Terrazona donating $10,000 and the folks at CLE for the Michigan fight donating, you know, some money in $2,500 and retailers spending thousands of dollars donating to this cause. There's a lot of people that are putting in their, uh, their, their, their monetary behind this because they understand how important it is to defend retailers. It dues up four hundred fifty dollars for your store um, really should just be the an investment into your store to kind of help us uh, do what we need to do. I mean, we you know it, it, for that and to be a part of of you know the defense of the entire industry. And so we've we've done this as Josh has said uh, on multiple occasions for people that aren't dues paying members uh, because it's important for us. It's important for the industry. Um, but I would just ask you know if you can you know please do your part because it, it, every little bit helps. I mean, really it does. We're a very small niche industry and. We are out spent probably 300 to one in terms of what the opposition has. But, you know, yeah. what we're we're very, very good at what we do. And we've been able to be very successful these past few years. Well, when you're up against, you know, federal, state and local governments, you're always going to have your, your opponents always going to have a bigger budget than you do. Right. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. it's end, end, endless yeah. pockets they have. And in the public health, in, indeed, Yoda. organized, well-funded, you know, a lot of times they're receiving government money to support their advocacy initiatives. Right. So, you know, we have to be very strategic, very careful, you know, that surgical approach that Scott mentioned. Uh, but, you know, it, 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 it is a challenge, but the, the data, fortunately, and all the research is on our side. And, and that message is carrying forth, you know, my first year, we set an ambitious goal of doing 250 meetings on Capitol Hill because I knew that there were a lot of people that didn't know what a premium cigar was, let alone we're going to vote for or against something based on our interests. And we did 350 meetings that year. And that, that was, you know, a traditional 2019 non-COVID year. But we're going to continue to bring people together, bring the industry together and provide for those verticals where people can communicate 
their views and all of the important work that the industry does. You know, the economic numbers, the health numbers, those are great. But think of how many golf tournaments and charity events that you go to where premium, the premium cigar industry supports those initiatives, some of them public health facing. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, that I, I, of any of the research that I want to compile in the future is the total impact of charitable giving of the premium cigar industry. Yeah. And that's one of the really interesting stories that I think that we tell often is what we mentioned Luciano before and the vast amounts of, of stuff that he does for different charities. And, you know, I say that his pal, the size of his palate is only surpassed by the size of his heart. Josh is smoking something called Los Caídos there, which gives back to, to fallen police officers and first responders. When you look at the amount that the cigar industry gives back to communities mm -hmm. it, per capita, I don't know of another industry that does more. Yeah. And, and, and you're talking about how, you know, you, you love your, your brothers and sisters that are out there that are smoking cigars with you. We all have a desire to, to give back as part of this, just because of the camaraderie and the feeling that we have and, and that, that passion, I think persuades us to do more, um, things that are larger than ourselves, I think, in, in that regard, because it's, 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 it's ubiquitous throughout this industry for people that are continuously giving back and charity. I can't even begin just in our own little sphere you know, when we were like, guys, we're, we're up a Creek right now in terms of what we're facing without a trade show and budget wise. And we're fighting for our lives here. God, we sent out just a simple email. Can anybody just donate some cigars? Cause we're going to do a fundraising event here. I mean, people, yeah, we're here, 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 here. Luciano, of course, spring the action here. I'm going to put together a pairings menu for you. I'll give you some cigars. I'm going to fly out there for you. Tom Mazuka at, at CLE Asylum came out and did it. I mean, all these people donate cigars, you know, Pete and Miami Cigars and a whole host of others. I'm sorry I'm going to miss some people. But that was just one instance in a matter of a couple of weeks. We had a spread of cigars that I was like, are you kidding me? And we nearly sold out. People were coming up to us, thanking us for this. They had a haul, you know, Alec Bradley, uh, if I would be remiss if I didn't mention them. But I mean, all of these, I mean, but that's just indicative of, of the heart of this industry. And that's a story that doesn't get told. And in so many of these restrictions, it's like, uh, you can't sponsor a golf tournament because it's tobacco. Are you kidding me? We have a golf tournament that's that's here to help you know people that have have been injured and are, are paralyzed now. And this money that we're raising is going to go to wheelchairs for these kids. Yeah, right. It's it's idiotic. You're not going to have cigar fight night here in D.C. that goes towards helping cure childhood cancer in the area. Give me a break. Yeah, this is idiotic, and they don't think through these things. To your point, it's either lazy and or it's on purpose because they don't care, and it's idiotic to just to say, "Look, we're not going to donate tens of thousands, actually, over the course of ten years, millions of dollars to children's cancer research because yeah. I don't I, I don't like tobacco smoke." I mean, it's well, there it's, was it's so idiotic to me. In in the in that same vein, uh, Abe Debabna from Smoke In, who's one of our sponsors on the show here and a good friend of ours. Uh, he told a story not long ago about a time that he tried to donate. Uh, it was five or ten thousand dollars to children's cancer research, and they wouldn't take us. They wouldn't take his check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it because does, it, yeah, it doesn't here's make the problem. It doesn't. And here's the problem with that we face as an industry, right? Is because for the first you know decades of the anti-smoking movement, it was focused on cigarettes. And what happened is we lost the narrative in the 90s that smoking equals cigarettes equals cancer equals death, right? right? Mm -hmm. And so now you have fantastically ignorant congressmen and senators that hold up a cigar or talk about a cigar, how it's 10 times bigger, therefore 10 times worse of the nicotine that you're getting in your system and it's going to kill you. Right. And I, you know, I'm basing that accent off of somebody's testimony that I heard. So I hope I don't yeah. offend anybody with that, but that's just me mimicking this guy when he was giving this testimony. And for me, I'm thinking that's not even close to being true. That's not even, right. it's like blaming corn for drunk driving. Wait, a politician said something that wasn't true. <laughs> right. Or, or, or accurate. I know it's, it's, it's <laughs> surprising, but you hear, heard it here first folks. That is crazy talk. Now, Josh, I want to go back to something you said earlier about strategy. And I think strategy is very important. And I got a private message from a shop owner in Michigan. I don't want to beat a dead horse in Michigan, but their comment is um, Michigan is looking at their tobacco tax in October. But do you believe fighting them on closing bars and lounges for a month and a half uh, for smoking will have any bearing on the decision making? Are we picking the wrong fight in Michigan? 
No, I, I think if anything, it helps mobilize and galvanize people for the tax cap fight. I think that the Michigan Association um, being as active at, as it's been the past three weeks are going to get more people involved in, in advocacy. Um, you know, I, I think that Dave and, and I and, and Glenn Loop, we talked about that. That was something that was discussed. You know, is this going to adversely affect us? And if you read the comments, and I did an interview with Cigar Aficionado, we're communicating policy, they're evaluating policy, and they're gonna change their opinion or their, their policy outcome based off of feedback that we gave. We're operating within the correct contours of what an association should do, what its members should do. And I think in the long run, we're gonna get more people um, that are enthusiastic and ready to go to preserve the tax cap fight. That is uh, something that we are, you know, from the onset of the reopening fight, we were talking even before this into 2020 about preserving the tax cap. So um, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. And I, I think that we'll, we'll be able to address that. And, and Dave, um, is doing a, a lot of work on the tax cap issue um, simultaneously with the efforts on reopening. Yeah, two 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 different areas of, of policy. First of all, health and human services. Another one is 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 um, obviously on tax policy. The, the the difference here is that you know they just passed this one point nine trillion dollar relief, right? That doesn't stop this administration from the momentum of all these special interest groups on raising taxes and going after some of these other policies that they want. What we've done here is really good work in terms of establishing ourselves as a block that needs to be listened to. As Josh said, we've done it appropriately. We haven't done anything, you know, going around or over somebody's heads or doing backdoor deals or anything like that. And nothing nefarious. It's all been above board. It's all been appropriate. They understand who we are and they understand we're coming with good data. And when we come with even better data with an economic analysis, it's going to make more sense. And they're going to understand, yeah, this is a group to listen to. And going back to, again, what we represent. We represent business owners. We represent voters. We represent taxpayers. We represent a very good block of people that we should be listening to because they're influential. And this is who we represent. And therefore, and they're coming with good, sound data. And so I think that it's something to where if we took it on the chin, they're going to turn around and say, this doesn't matter. They're just going to take whatever we're going to give them. But now they know we're organized yeah. and we're going to speak up when something is wrong. And we're going to fight for what is truly going to be something that is beneficial, not only to us as a block, but to the community at large. Vis-a-vis, -vis, you're going to get more tax revenue if you keep this in place. And it's important to note that in the reopening discussions, that is something that's on the regulatory side with the, the governor's office and the health and human, human services department. We leverage political allies in the state legislature, but both Republicans and Democrats. So it was bipartisan work um, of, of putting political pressure on the administration for a policy change. As it relates to the tax cap, that is something that are, we're gonna be principally working the legislative front. Um, so those folks that we got involved in the reopening process, we're gonna be going back to those same champions and um, you know, fighting the tax cap fight. So, so something along those lines that I'm curious about from, from, from one state to another, uh, is if you're approached with a situation where you're faced with a, 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 a big tax increase and also uh, some frivolous smoking bans like no indoor smoking and things like that uh, or shutting down grandfathered cigar bars. If you're faced with, uh, you know, that that choice, is there is there a particular line? You Do you always go after the tax hill before you go after the ban the smoking ban hill or do, does it change depending on the situation it, it changes uh based on the situation but you know for most for the most of the fights that we're active in there's a likelihood of actual movement we're not going to deploy resources for something that we know where we can do a few little things to make sure that it's defeated. Um, a lot of stuff in the States happens behind the scenes. It's picking up the phone, calling a representative, calling the person that introduced the bill 
for instance, you know, there was a, a state senator in Pennsylvania that was looking to uh, close exemptions to the Clean Air Act that would essentially prohibit uh, private clubs from smoking indoors. And we called uh, that member and got confirmation that he's not going to advance uh, the, the bill and, you know, forward because of the information that we presented. Um, so that, you know, that bill is still out there. That, that bill still could move, but we work behind the scenes and we're able to get uh, what we wanted there. I think the tough thing for our government affairs uh, department is that a lot of what we do is preventing bad policy. So, you know, our score is zero and that's good for us. Um, so, you know, fortunately, we've been able to raise some money off of advocacy. You know, I, I told Scott and our, our board, my hope is in two years that advocacy will be 100% self-sufficient where, you know, we can raise the resources off of the wins that we achieve. Um, I am extremely proud, and, and I, I think Scott is uh, as well, of our team and the successes that we've had in the past two years. Um, you know, it, from the litigation front to the legislation front, um, premium cigars are in the PCA and our partners um, in other coordinate associations are brand names on Capitol Hill and in state capitals. And that is us us doing our job. Yeah, I like to say we're the left tackle uh, because, you know, <laughs> if the left tackle off gets zero sacks, he's had a great game, right? Mm -hmm. and that, but it's not a sexy stat, right? It's not 500 passing yards and six yeah. touchdowns. And, yeah, yep. so, uh, yeah, we're, we're the left tackles when it comes to this kind of thing. So I want to go into a little bit of – well, so it'll sort of lead into cigar media talk, but it kind of it kind of starts with our story as far as how about that cigar. So, um, Garrett and I have been friends for many years, and um, I was with another media organization, Blind Man's Puff, before I started. How about that cigar? And those guys are fantastic. We we still love everything they do, but you know, at a point, I reached where I said, "Okay, I'm going to go out and start my own thing," and. Uh, in early 2019, uh, or maybe it was late 2018, um, I, I kind of wanted to, I didn't want to just, you know, throw up a podcast and get on YouTube and I wanted to sort of do it right, whatever that might mean. Uh, so I formed a, you know, actual LLC and all that stuff and started right off in early 2019, uh, filed uh, application to be a media member with PCA, um, became a member, paid the dues, and was really looking forward to the first year for, for us to cover the PCA trade show in 2019. As, as uh, life sometimes happens, my wife and I uh, sold a house and bought a new house uh, and closed pretty much right when the trade show was going to happen. So I was like, there's no way I'm going to leave my wife alone to do all that. I'm, right. We're not to the trade show in 2019 so we didn't didn't make it to the trade show um and then uh first of the year 2020 renewed the pca membership uh and then 2020 happened so you know yeah. that is what it is um but so full disclosure i have still not renewed our pca membership and i want to talk <laughs> a little bit about i want to talk a little bit about why so for for us as uh, as a small growing media company, um, and and to go back to 2019, this was all out of pocket. There was no, we didn't have any ad revenue. Started all this from I I talked to my wife. I said, hey, I want to borrow some of the money from my year end bonus and start this new thing. She said, yeah, go for it, have fun. So put all that money out of pocket, and then. 2020 got a little bit of ad revenue 2021 now have a little bit more ad revenue um but it's it's still uh you know it's it's break even if we're lucky it's pretty much still sure. some out of pocket cost every year so for a small growing media company like us considering the role that media can play at the trade show and for the industry as a whole uh when you consider the cost of the PCA membership on top of 
the costs that 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 we incurred attending the trade show with flights, hotels, Ubers, meals, things like that. Um, for a small company like us, we have to look at return on investment. And uh, when it comes to the 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 dues themselves for the PCA trade show, and honestly, the reason I haven't renewed is because I've really been kind of waiting to see if the trade show is actually going to happen. Because oh, you're uh, not alone, my friend. Yeah. So so I, I guess I, that I want you guys to sell me, you know, and, and not sell me. I I I just want an honest answer. Why should why should HBT Media LLC renew membership with the PCA because it's, you know, again, for a small media company like us, that's a huge expenditure. I mean, $450 really doesn't sound like a lot of money, but for, for a media company that makes not much more than that in ad revenue, you know, the return on investment can be, can be uh, daunting. So, you know, what is, absolutely what do you guys have to say to that? Yeah, you know, it's a really interesting thing. And so, you know, I've been in, in uh, trade associations and nonprofits for the majority of my career, 20 years going on now, or more than 20 years, actually. And this is really the first one that has this type of membership relationship with media. Uh, and as I did some digging when I first got here a few years ago, uh, it really kind of comes down to a legal protection when it comes to the trade show. As a closed members only event, uh, you're able to get whatever they hand out at the trade show so that you can smoke, et cetera, as a member of the association, because it is, you know, technically a B2B show with the tobacco laws being where they're at. You can't just necessarily get free samples. And it's kind of one of the main reasons we're able to operate the way we're able to operate um, in, in Nevada um, in Las Vegas, for, for that matter. Uh, there's some other places that, you know, we've kind of looked at for that, but it's all pretty similar in that regard. Um and so there's other licensors and things like that that we would technically have to go through if we were to hold this in other states and people were able to get cigars, et cetera. So that's really just sort of just to give you a little bit of background of what I understand, sort of the, the relationship with with media um, in that regard. And as new media kind of be, has become more and more prominent, more and more part of the culture, uh, you know, I think that that the organization has been trying to understand exactly what what is that relationship. I mean, it's necessary. Um, I think you've heard me talk about this before. I mean, there's so many restrictions on what manufacturers and brands can do in terms of advertising. How do you reach consumers? I mean, we couldn't even advertise the trade show on Facebook because it was about tobacco. So it's one of those things to where for us, we want as many outlets as possible that can help celebrate this great industry and all the great things that the manufacturers are doing. So we want that relationship. I think what really this kind of boils down to is maybe for us and, and working with the 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 media figuring out what that relationship really means in the future because it's not really a media association relationship that you're looking at right now right i mean it's not like um it's like a it's not like you're you're a part of, a, of an association of cigar media folks right that you guys are all together and you're paying your dues because you're getting x y and z out of it, it, it it's, it's it's a retailer association that has a trade show and you just want to be able to get access to that trade show so i get that um and 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 i think that that as we kind of look where we're at now and, and to your point here, why pay dues? Um, you know, really for you, the, the most honest answer I'm going to give you, and this isn't a sales pitch because I, you know, quite frankly, uh, you know, I'm kind of done with sales pitches. <laughs> but the honest answer I can give you is if you're not going to come to the show and you don't feel like you're going to be able to leverage that show to earn you what you need to get um, for your show, then don't do it. I mean, that's that's the bottom line. Um, you know, if, if, uh, you know, there's ways that you can help contribute as far as the fight, you know, like this, getting the word out, getting consumers engaged and involved that you can help with the community. There's a lot of ways you can be a phenomenal ally, um, that, that really, that, that, that does that, you know? Um, and so as you're looking at that, I totally get it. I get it as far as that. I mean, you know, look, my wife has a business, I get business expenses. She opened up a business last year on March 1st and closed down on March 13th because of the pandemic. So I'm acutely aware of, of how that impacts um, businesses um, and, and endeavors such as yourself. So that's my, that, that's on, not my honest answer to you is, is that if you're going through this and you're like, look, we're going to spend X amount of money. We don't know, certainly know if we're going to be able to earn that back. Or if this is something that we can put in a lot, put, put an investment in that we think we're going to get back by the time we, you know, go next year because we can do, 
you know, 15 different interviews and get these tip types of clips and we can, you know, repurpose these and do these things and create these commercials and get paid for them out of it. I, you know, I would look at it as a business uh, proposition myself and say, you know what, if that's the case, I'm not sure I'm going to go ahead and invest this, this amount. Cause to your point, right. The, the dues are one thing, but the flights, the hotel, the food, that's all going to be way more expensive than the dues, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's, that's the challenge that you face. And quite frankly, if you're looking at it and, and it doesn't add up for you, then don't do it. Just, just keep focusing on what your core is there for how about that cigar. And as it grows, then it becomes a larger part of it. And then just be a part of the conversation with us as we continue. I see Coop there in, in, in the, uh, the comments, as we continue to grow the relationship with, with the media, let's figure this out together. Cause I really think that, that, um, uh, uh, there, there's a better way and a better place for us to get to in terms of this. Um, and like I said, it's, this is really non-traditional with the way that it works with the, with the trade association and the media. Uh, I definitely think there's a better path forward for us. Uh, we just kind of got to get through the, the COVID aspect of all of this kind of yeah. stuff first and, and, and having a show. Uh, to kind of look forward to 2022 and kind of what that might be. But I definitely think there's a more positive place for us to get to in our relationship with media than this kind of quasi weird membership facet that it currently exists in. And just to nuance it a, a little bit, I think that in terms of the, the dues that were paid last, last year, you know, the one thing with the association not having a trade show you know, the services of advocacy never stopped. Um, that was the one facet where, you know, your contribution was part of the fight. Your contribution went to protect the industry from the lawsuits, from the legislation, from the regulations. And, um, you know, for, for media in particular, one of the areas of concern for me, looking at all of the uh, policies that, that we're facing, is the, the term characterizing flavors. Um, if you'll notice in cigar action in our policy uh, position, we actually talk about cigar media and how they educate consumers. And you know, the term characterizing flavors would prohibit um, you know, basically either you know, shelf talkers that manufacturers use or cigar media for describing cigars, just as I described El Politico, um, you know, moments ago of having notes of, of cocoa and cedar, things like that. So, you know, we are doing things and in, in, uh, to protect cigar media from an advocacy perspective. We are going to continue to do that. I think that it's um, an integral linchpin to uh, educating consumers across the board and making, you know, well-educated purchase decisions uh, for, for consumers. So that's something that's going to continue. Um, and we hope to engage with media. If there, if there is something in the policy, you know, arena that we can help improve for how about that cigar so you can continue to grow and, and um, you know, reach your audience of cigar consumers and retailers and manufacturers, uh, we're open to that, uh, to continue to fight as your advocate uh, in Congress and state capitals alike. Yeah, yeah. Well, just a, sorry, I was just going to make one more point oh, there ahead, with, with, with Coop about the uh, early entrance. Um, just to kind of put a finer point on sort of my priority and approach to this is that um, we've even discussed in the planning phases of the trade show, and this was going to be implemented last year, but even more so this year, of some additional things that we would like to do for media at the trade show. Um, you know, my start in 2019 when we did the press conference, um, <laughs> uh, that which uh, for, for Cigar Con and the rebrand when it was kind of, you know, feasting of, of wolves there, but uh, it, it was it was actually a lot of, it was a lot of fun. I mean, it was, you know, <laughs> I, mean, for, for, I, I remember doing the Q&A when uh, the retailer kind of excoriated me and how it was my idea. I said, I, I said don't, please don't shoot the messenger. In this case, literally, this has been brewing for five years. I'm just trying to I'm just trying to, to do what they're asking me to do here. And, and I've been a part of it. And quite frankly, I was trying to get it to the point where it was. But but we, anyway, but the whole point here is that we did the press conference and and um, and, and 
in for us to as well to, to do to do more to integrate kind of what the media does at the show and and for the consumers for the brands more in particular who are our customers really um having the media there does help that and so we've got some things planned that we'd like to do for this year that will be coming out as you know in, in a little bit um so I'm, I'm hopeful that we can kind of take some some good steps here at the show this year in terms of, of media as well um, so that might be my only sales pitch is that we'll, we'll have some extra perks this year at the show for, for media that haven't existed in the past. Um, and so um, that, that would probably be my only sales pitch. But really, that's just because, again, we're looking to grow our relationship with the media uh, overall as a trade association, but also in terms of your participation in the show as well. And yeah. to continue this um, <clears throat> conversation about, you know, the the memberships, be it media or, uh, you know, lounge owners, shop owners what what percentage of money goes to legislation versus the show and i know we touched on that a little bit earlier but if we can talk about you know membership um you know for a shop owner what is their uh, what do they get outside of you know we know that they get legislative help we know that they get to come to the show but if we could break down that money and talk about where the pca is at currently financially how are how are you doing? How, you know, what does that cash flow look like? Sure, absolutely. So, um, talked about it earlier as far as the dues coming in, is it, a lot of it goes towards legislation. A lot of what we also do is that we have affinity programs. So, uh, we've had a lot of members had a lot of issues this year with their payment processor. So, a lot of what we do as well is that we look for programs that actually help you run your business. So, uh, like Jay Davis, for example, down in Dallas, Texas, he, his payment processor cut him off because of tobacco. And mm -hmm. so within uh, within just about an hour, it's like a Friday night. I was like, God, that's the worst time to cut you off, man, when you're heading into your weekend. Um, so within, I think, 48 hours, we had them back up with with the premium tobacco payment processing. It's a separate company, but it's a, it's one that we have a relationship with and contracts with that guarantee they won't cut them off just because it's tobacco. Um, and I mean, look, the good news is, is that a small per percentage of the proceeds actually comes back to us. It's not a lot of money, but I mean, look, like you said, every little bit helps, right? Yeah. Uh, we have an insurance program, not a health insurance, but an insurance for your store program that we also do discounts on shipping and discounts on some of those types of things as well. Um, we have a brand new one that's it's all in store uh, advertising where you get like a free display at your point of sale that, that is, is marketing and advertising that that PCA's agreement is that you're allowed to resell that space to some local shops and, and other places for advertising. But it also provides um, auto generated content as well for your consumers to, to look at um, at your point of sale. And another one of discounted marketing and swag items. So if you're ordering marketing flyers or marketing pieces or giveaways, things like that, we have a, a program that you can get discounts on those types of things as well. Um, so that's a lot of part of that. The other part is um, the education. And that's something that I've uh, been actually really focused on. It, it's been kind of stop and start and stop and start based upon some challenges. But we've got some really good people that, that have been helping us work on getting this retailer excellence program together about sharing of best practices and ways in which we can kind of help go through and do sort of a self audit of your store and and work on generating, you know, a, a better store, better employees, more informed employees. Um, but I think one of the main things and I know that this is it's kind of weird and maybe a little bit abstract to think about. But when you think about this, this is actually kind of one of the, 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 the sort of raison d'etre of everything that we've done over the past couple of years is the substantial equivalence fight because what this really means and for the consumers out there there was this rule that basically would have said that if a cigar didn't exist before 20 2007 sorry uh it would have to come off the shelves and and this process by which you have to go to get this application in and prove all the constituents that are inside of a cigar don't harm you it was it was this constituent testing that was going to be akin to a cigarette and they had all these crazy things that were in there well, we, we won this fight which means now that retailers don't have to worry about any of these products they're bringing into their stores. And so many of your your viewers out there, I guarantee the, the what they love going and talking to the retailers about is, hey, what's new? You know, tell me, tell me what you got, right? Tell me, tell me, tell me what Luciano's planted. Tell me about the traveler. You know, tell me about this. This is this is a great cigar. I love Lancero. So tell me about this thing, right? Now these products products have have an unfettered access to come to market because of this and we invested a ton of time and money and resources into ensuring that with our partners the CRA and ensuring that that was going to happen uh, that we could win that fight and we did um, and so that's kind of one of the key points and I know that that doesn't necessarily mean oh hey I'm going to continue to see return on investment but that's kind of you know where where that product is in terms of financially 
obviously last year was a struggle. You know, our, our main revenue driver didn't happen. Um, thankfully, again, we have so many great people in this industry um, with manufacturers who said, hey, just roll my booth forward. Um, you know, a lot of them, you know, 80, about 80 percent said, yeah, just go ahead and keep it. It's fine. Uh, the vast lion's share of the really big guys all just said, yeah, no, that's fine. Just keep you roll it forward. We support you. We know what you're doing is important. Uh, they're all still engaged for this year. Um, obviously they have questions like everybody else about it, but you know, as far as the show is still happening, you know, it's great. I love guys like Christian and Pete and, 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 you know, Jason down on Miami and, and all those guys, Carlito, George, they're all just guys, if you're having a show, we're there, we're in, we're going to support you. And that's the, yeah. that's, that's just the way they've always been. So, um, cash flow wise, it's going pretty good. Uh, you know, all things considered membership dues have been rolling in. Um, at a pretty good rate. Retailers have actually been uh, higher this year than they were last year as far as the renewals. I think there's a lot of excitement for retailers right now about getting back to a trade show. The retailers love the show. They love, you know, that that camaraderie. They love the networking. They love the products, obviously. Um, and then, you know, more and more people now are starting to, to, to book booths again uh, now that we're you know kind of getting settled as far as all that's concerned. So cash flow started to come back a little bit. If we can have the show, it's going to help obviously a lot better. But, you know, 2022 is really the year that we're going to kind of get back to good as far as the association is concerned. Um, but, you know, we're, we're, we're starting to, to, to make progress, more progress now. Yeah. Well, and and to go back to, you know, our discussion about HBT media and and dues and all that stuff is is it I, I want you guys to know if this isn't something that we've ruled out it's just it's mm -hmm. something that we we sit and and you know look at very carefully uh and all that and honestly for for us as 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 media but but for a newer media company you know our goal with this show and with the website and everything is consumer education and also we bring on a lot of brand people so that they can tell their stories and feature their products and things like that but what I've experienced in the past at the trade show back when I was with blind man's puff is it's just such a, it, it's such a great time to build relationships and uh, every business is about relationships, but cigars are even more so. And yeah. I, I genuinely do believe that the trade show and other large events are, are, are almost, uh, almost just a vital time for us for everybody, all the retailers, all the manufacturers, all your fellow media people and things like that. It's just to have everybody in the same place at the same time is, is, uh, is, it's just an experience. And it's also a, um, I think it's a benefit, um, you know, to everybody. And, and I think it would be a huge benefit to us as a newer media company, um, because we've been fortunate to get to know a lot of people through the show, but there is something about, you know, sitting together in the same room, smoking a cigar and talking about brands and, you know, even talking about stuff outside of cigars, talking about your kids and yeah. talking about your hobbies and stuff like that. Um, and I, I think that is one of the biggest benefits that I personally have experienced at the trade show is just getting to know you guys and getting to know the other brand owners and the other media people. Um, and, and I think that's, that's one of the things that, that goes, that, that makes it in my mind, that's one of the things that, that kind of leans me over that, that, that edge of saying, okay, screw it. Let's just pay the dues because <laughs> it's, it really is. I mean, I, 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 and I do know that the money goes to support the industry and that is important to us as well. But being able to um, to FaceTime and 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 network and and just get to know the people in the industry that we love so much beyond just a you know a, a, a video call like this. And to piggyback on that, a uh, quote from a shop owner I talked to was. Um, the relationships are why I go to the PCA. The trade show is a, is a big part of, you know, not only getting uh, deals on, you know, inventory and getting kind of first dibs on new stuff that's coming out. He said, but with the TPE getting a bigger footprint, what is the PCA doing to compete with TPE and, having them steal the show. 
Oh wow! <laughs> steal the show. That's, that's steal the show. That's bold talk. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's. Uh, I think this year that's probably feeling is more acute than ever because they pushed theirs to May. Um, I, seemingly, they're going to be able to 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 put it on. I guess uh, from what I've seen coming out. Um, uh, so. You know, I'm not sure if uh, if they have designs to seal the show, um, but uh, first and foremost, the way I look at it, any competition is good because it's, it's going to make us get better That's right. uh, in terms of what we're doing. Uh, you know, I think that uh, we we don't want to be stale, right? And so that's what we've got to come out of. We've got to say, look, it, it's it's not just business as usual anymore, and the world has changed, and and in a lot of ways for the better. Um, so we need to meet the demands of of what what's out there. Um, and so when we're looking at that, um, you know, I could, you know, you never have to worry about, you know, you know, fetish pee at our shows. So that's at least a benefit that we have going in our favor that, you know, you don't have a, a, a Padron booth next to something like that. Um, maybe that's a knock on our show. I don't know. Um, but, you know, we, we are looking at saying, OK, I, you know, for, for the main thing is, is that we have premium tobacconists that are coming here. And that's really their primary. We do have some people that come that that do have more things that that are the alternatives. And I think that there's a world in which both of those should coexist, especially if you have a footprint of premium cigars in your store even if that isn't the majority of what you're selling. I think that there's a world where both of those can exist. I think that for us, what we are primarily focused on is a lot of what you talked about, right? Is products are, are a major component of it, right? And, and so much of what we like to start to focus, what we'd like to start to focus on is how do we enable, uh, and we, we did some surveys, right? And our retailers talk about that it's, it's learning about products and it's vendor relationships as to the reasons why we come to the show. And so for us, we've been focused on how do we create experiences the same way that our retailers create experiences for folks to come in and enjoy a cigar journey? How do we create experiences for people to enhance these business relationships? How do we create experiences for our retailers to be able to get the products and get to know the products better? So that they, a better educated retailer is going to sell more cigars. There's just, you know, it's definitive proof that that happens. And yeah. so we want to be able to enable that. So we're really focused on how do we get better product education? How do we get retailers more access to those products and or those vendors um, in terms of that? And, and creating more opportunity and space for just exactly what you were talking about, building those relationships. I've talked to a lot of retailers that say, look, my, my business is successful because I've got great relationships with these vendors because I sell this specific product like nobody else does around the country or at least in my territory because of my relationship, because of the events that we have. And, and, I, and I focus on this and we've got relationships with the customers. And, and, and I think that that filters through whether it's a sales rep, whether it's a broker or whether it's the vendor themselves as they're just starting out that relationship with the retailer who has got this great vast it's like the closet in the lion the witch in the wardrobe of the wardrobe <laughs> because it, you enter narnia when you come into these stores right and it's this vast world that they're your guide and they get to take you on all these various journeys and being able to you know sit down with luciano and listen to him talk through his blends and the stories of his cigars to take that and translate that back to your customers is going to translate into business. So our focus, it's not to, not to get too far down the rabbit hole on this, but uh, one of the things I've focused on since uh, coming here is a, a business kind of approach to this, which is our job as an association is to solve the job of our retailers, which is ultimately to, to be more profitable. Right. Yeah. And, and to, in order to do that, you need to have, well, obviously, this, the regulatory security, uh, but at the same time, good business resources, which we've been focused on bringing up as well with some of this stuff that I was talking about earlier. And that last piece, really, which is the most important piece, is that relationship with the vendor, how we can provide better uh, avenues for that and better access uh, to products and product education. Right on. So what's, what is the number one thing that you want consumers to know that the pca is doing for them keeping the price of cigars uh lower because of taxes uh keeping your ability to enjoy cigars in multiple uh venues whether it's a cigar bar cigar lounge uh open even in your own home for some of the more draconian uh fascist inclined localities around the country that would even come into your home and take your cigars away from you um 
that's our more that's our most important for our most important focus is on uh, keeping consumers uh keeping their right to be able to enjoy a cigar at the same time keeping that price point to where it really should be like most other retailers around this country in other uh, industries they having to worry about so many additional taxes that are placed as a burden on top of them josh if you want to go ahead and jump in there I agree completely. I think that there's countless examples of that. Florida, you know, I was just in Miami uh, two weeks ago and smoked a cigar on the beach. And that's something that's under under siege right now, whether you're able to smoke in public beaches and public parks. And, um, you know, we, we have to continue to assert those talking points that we mentioned earlier in the show and, and fight for those consumers. You know, we mentioned cigaraction.org, you know, a couple times. That's the gateway for consumers to, to really uh, gain an understanding of the issues that we're facing and what we're doing to fight for them, um, you know, alongside CRA and our, our, our partners there. So um, it, it is important that, uh, that, that they're involved and in tune and engaged because, you know, the threats are there. They're always going to be there. Uh, but we have to con continue to uh, drum up the fight and, and, and get the, as many supporters as we can um, going in the, the same direction. I think I, I use the example, consumers, retailers, and manufacturers are the three spokes of the wheel. And we can't yeah. move forward. We can't uh, be in motion without those three. And yeah. um, consumers play uh, an incredible role in, in all the work that we do. Well, along the same, so basically the same question on the retailer end, what's the number one thing you want retailers to know that you're doing for them and how do you demonstrate and communicate that to them? Yeah, I'm going to go, I'm going to go back to and see exactly what I just said is that we are focused on uh, being a, a total association and, and it's a growing process. And so my first ask really is be a part of that process and also be patient, right? We're going through um, an evolution that is sometimes painful for us, but we're, we're a trade association trying to evolve, which is uh, a lot more challenging than just a, a small startup company or company trying to change. Right. Um, yeah. I would say liken it a little bit. To, I'm not going to, you know, it was very difficult for Kodak to change, right? Kodak invented the digital camera. Kodak invented Instagram before there was Instagram, but they could not get away from the digital film because it was still making so much money at the time that now Kodak is, is really relatively irrelevant in, in most places, right? Um, and so that's what we don't want to be. And so we're, we're trying to pivot in terms of what we do as a trade association. And that really ultimately is how do we help retailers and by retailers as well to then translating to manufacturers, how do we help retailers run more profitable businesses? What can we do as an association? We're not going to be able to be all things to all retailers, right? But there are things where our, our resources and our services can align with either pain points or gain opportunities for those retailers. And that's where we want to be. And that's why we want more participation. We've you know, gotten to the point where we have started to open up board nominations. So if there's anybody retailer out there that's interested in serving on the board, you can put your name in. Applications will be due at the end of this month. We're going to have more open elections, more open committee participation. We were stalled last year because of COVID and how some things changed with the association, but more open committee participation. So as a retailer, we're really focused on that. The trade show represents that as a part of it, but really we want to be able to take all the benefits that you get out of the trade show and stretch that over 365 days a year. And then obviously everything Josh does, if you want to kind of hammer that point. Yeah, home, Josh, I, would, I would just to add on, onto it, you know, for retailers, we are a rapid response center. Um, we're the first line of defense when it comes to bad policy and good policy. Um, and, and we're continuing to message that um, throughout all of the elected officials, throughout the regulators, and uh, it's a drumbeat that will be continuous. Uh, you know, our our theme for our government affairs, I prepare and work with our team um, every year that I've been on board to prepare a strategy document. And the title of the strategy document this year was Retailer First. And, um, you know, I think that that's a theme that's going to continue this year, especially in this post-COVID era, as people try to uh, recover and you know in certain states they were more affected than others and we got to make sure that they get the resources and the information so that they can reopen rebound and um, you know see this continue 
this industry continue to not only survive, but thrive. And I want to see that stat of new cigar lounges and new cigar retail stores uh, continue rather than shutter their doors. So um, that, that to me is the biggest testament that we can do is, um, you know, continuously fight for the industry and, um, you know, protect it against uh, the lunacy of, of the policy uh, world and the initiatives that are coming down the pike. Yeah. And so going back to, uh, I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly when, but sometime in, in 2020, um, the, uh, the staff of the PCA was furloughed, but, and then we saw gradually some coming back. So, uh, I just want to get a, get a sense of the, the health and the sort of the stability of the staff staffing levels and things like that at the PCA right now. What does that look like? Yeah, so um, we were able to bring back four uh, of the the six uh, as we were furloughed, myself and Josh included. Um, and so basically, um, as we're as I talked about, we're starting to get back to where we are, and it's going to kind of take this trade show to really get us back to to where we could be. Um, and so, uh, unfortunately, um, it just really kind of wasn't fair to to say, look, there's you know two of us to dangle on and hold on for another six more months or four more months until we can kind of get there. And, um, you know, and so, uh, it was just an unfortunate situation because of that. I mean, we, we losses were in the millions of dollars, obviously for us. And so, um, we're, we're, we're looking at, as we've gotten back through this to start to step up. The other part too, is that we weren't able to, um, our, our state association, uh, director, Rachel, left last year kind of at the beginning of all of this and so that was another position we didn't fill so we're just getting back to the point to where um we're going to be able to bring glenn loop on I and mean, he's been an advisor for us but we're looking to bring him on uh full time as a state advocacy director um in a couple of weeks starting april 1st right and so that's that's important for us to get that uh, aspect of our services back and as we continue to move through this and have a, a successful trade show we're going to be able to get ramp up our staff back up to where we need to and, and have it refocused on a lot of these areas that we were just talking about. So it was one of those things to where, uh, unfortunately we just had to contract for a little bit to um, stave off what we were kind of going through. Um, and gradually now we're just in that sort of rebuild process. Good. I'm glad to hear Hopefully, that. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I think, well, before oh, we got one more, before we do that, um, I just want to, uh give our viewers and listeners if you were watching some of our live stuff as we were going down to ristafari matt and i had a little contest <laughs> oh that's right and the contest was how many cigars matt and i was gonna we're gonna smoke so i after i dropped you off i had one on the way home perfect so if that adds to the that's yeah perfect. that adds one to the number that is perfect uh, then we definitely have a winner, and that okay. winner is Matt Trenda. Oh, really? Who guessed the number 32. 32. So, so guys, we did this face this quick Facebook Live video on our, on our drive down to Ristafari. We did the same thing last year, basically giving a contest saying we're going to give a prize to whoever guesses the total amount of cigars that Garrett and I smoke between the two of us during that weekend. And so there's just, so last year I think was 37. It was this year was 32. Yep. So, and it was a day less, you know, that we were down there. This yeah. We week. went an extra day last year. So um, yeah, good. 32, was 30, 32 out of how many days? Uh, two days, 32, Ooh. 32 cigars, two guys, two days, two and a half, two and a half days. Yeah. So not bad. We could have done better. We'll try harder next we'll year. We'll try a lot harder next year. <laughs> so congrats. That's, that's that's Josh's morning. <laughs> if, if you guys come to the trade show, you got to beat eighty-seven. Oh no, no! I did when I was when I was at uh, when I was at Drew Estate in Nicaragua in twenty fifteen. One day I did sixteen, and it was I. I don't. I don't recommend it. <laughs> I don't recommend it. Right now, right now, I'm at about five, six, seven per day. Uh, that day when I did 16 was that was a bad decision. Yeah, yeah. that yeah. Uh, must have been a <laughs> yeah. All so right, I think now, but it, now I think it is time for this week's numero de los muertos. 
And as always, ladies and gentlemen, Numero de los Muertos is brought to us by Smoke In Cigars. So please visit SmokeIn.com. Visit Honest Abe and all the great, fantastic crew over there at Smoke In Cigars and find great prices, great selection, and great people. So this week's number is... This week's number is 10. 10 people in North America, well, the U.S., uh, 10 people in the U.S. die every year from this, and it is an occupation. Wow, a hint already. Mm-hmm. I hate when it's a low number. Low numbers are always tougher. They are. Yeah, 10 die right. from this occupation. Occupa- telephone line worker. No, but... That's not far, man. That's actually a really good guess. Wow, right out of the gate. Yeah. Um, um, a, a roofer. Nope. Am I getting warmer or colder with that guess? Occupation. It's kind of a lateral movement. A lateral. All right, fair enough. Do we get to ask questions? Uh, yeah, it's like a 20 uh, questions type situation. Yeah. Uh, are those 10 people mostly men? Yes. Okay. Hard labor? Mm, I wouldn't necessarily put it in the category of hard labor. More like more. Okay. Um, I mean, maybe. Does it involve heights? It does. Window washer? I've done that one. Yeah, we did that one. It is not. Um, Uh,. Wait, what did Scott say first? Um, line line worker? He said telephone. Telephone. Or power line. And that's not it? Yeah. Uh, it involves heights, mostly men, 10 per year. Um, U.S. only, did you say? Mm-hmm. U.S. only. Uh, Chimney sweep? Mm. Oh, that's a good that guess. That is a good guess. That's nope. not it, though? Nope. Okay. We need to go high. <laughs> Got to go higher, mm-hmm. oh. higher, higher. So let's see. So uh, on 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 like skyscraper buildings, no. bridges, Mm-mm. not bridges. Mm-mm. Jeff Orbo. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, is it tree tree? Oh, trim- not tree trimmers. Not tree trimmers. That was a good one. That was a really good one. That was. Uh, Bricklayers? Anywhere from 100 to 600 feet. Oh, wow. Okay, that's high. That's way up there. It's not bridges. It's not skyscrapers. Mm -mm. Not trees. Mm -mm. Uh... (laughs) I've got a guy texting me answers, (laughs) and it's pretty funny. Crossing guard. <laughs> Crossing guard. Crossing guard. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Alan, I guess window washer, but he said they've already done that one before. But you didn't outright say no. You just said you've done it before. Uh, That's true. It is not window washer. It's not window washer. Uh, it's not on a building, he said. Correct. Is it in is a vehicle? It? No. It's, so it's not airplane. It on a vehicle. Like, was well, it like on, on an airplane it is a, vehicle? It's a stationary. Like a rock climber? Mm-mm. <laughs> occupation well i mean alex honnold is a professional rock climber um uh occupation, occupation but is are they up on rocks no is it something physical they're on correct yes 100 to 600 feet in the air not a telephone pole not a power line Oh, a radio tower? Yes. No. Oh, so those big, those big tall towers that. Yep. Oh my gosh. So either uh, putting new equipment or changing light bulbs Uh or putting. Man, uh, I was close with the telephone thing. You were, man. And I kept veering off. I think Ronnie's right. I think it's a bank teller. I think you're just. (laughs) (laughs) I think they slip. 
and they slip and fall and lose change and bonk their heads. I think that's what it is. It's that one They're, bank teller up on Pike's Peak. Yeah, who's who comes back after throwing too many back at, at lunch, right? And he comes back and he <laughs> falls down and slips on loose change. So your hard labor uh, question, that was, you know, see why that's uh, that's kind of a tough Yeah, thing. yeah, that is. I got you. Well, there's some of those dudes that put videos on, on Facebook or, oh or YouTube gosh. where they, they wear a body cam or a helmet cam climbing up those towers. Yes. And then they show the view looking around. That looks pretty sweet to me. That's uh, as long do. as my feet are firmly on the ground. I, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> right. Yeah. I have vertigo. So when I start climbing up places, sometimes the horizon starts to do this just, Oh yeah. Just on wow. me. And yeah. Yeah. Not a job I will interview for probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably not. You could so, interview. I don't know how far you'll get with the vertigo though. I know, but uh, you know, I was looking at, you know, some of the statistics and stuff around it. Um, you know, these jobs, some of these jobs start at 60,000 and go north and way north of there, depending on uh, where yeah. they are. So, uh, hazard payment. Oh, that's oh. absolutely hazard payment. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and only 10, you know, on average, 10 a dot, 10 year, 10 people a, a year die. Um, it's really not bad. Well, but how many do it though? I mean, if it's 10 out of 50, that's staggering. But if it's 10 out of like 10,000, <laughs> then we're getting a little better. That's true. It's probably more than 50. It's probably a few thousand. I, yeah, yeah. I, I would probably guess. It's not bad. Thousand. Your odds are still good. <laughs> <laughs> not as good as sitting here doing this, smoking well, cigars, like, talking about cigars. Right, right. That's, an, that's another point we can use. There you it's go. Less dangerous smoking cigars <laughs> than working on a radio tower. That's right. Come on. Or being yeah. a clown in a rodeo. <laughs> I did that one as too. We, as yeah. we found out. Yeah, that was mine. You guys oh, that's that. great. That last yeah. Year, yeah. So that is this week's numero, numero de los muertos. Brought to you by Smoking Cigars. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know why I did that. I have That's no fun. explanation. So, Scott, last time you were on, we had just started kind of into these fun lightning round questions. So we're not going to give you those same questions again, but I have some okay. new ones. So, uh, and Josh, we're going to start with you. If you could bring back any fashion trend from the past, what would it be? Ascot. The Ascot. Ascot. 100%. I, I wear it occasionally. Oh wow! Do you really? <laughs> but I go to Miami only. <laughs> uh, Fred from Scooby Doo. Oh, Fred! Yeah, he yeah. wears he wears a pretty mean ass cap. Yeah. That actually he kind does of does indeed. Your pocket square. Your pocket square there. Indeed. Yeah. All you right, need so a matching ascot. Yeah. yeah. Scott, for you, if you could bring back any fashion trend from the past. Assless chaps. <laughs> Would those ever really go out of style, in? though? <laughs> I mean, I think that's that's kind of that's that's it's time publicly acceptable to wear those in public anymore. So <laughs> it's timeless. You it never it. never goes out of style. Um, <laughs> all right, Scott, you're first on this one. Uh, all right, who was your childhood or teenage celebrity crush? Cindy Crawford. Oh. That is a, that is a very good answer. That Pepsi commercial was that hot. Pepsi commercial. Yep. Yeah, my yep. wall was peppered with uh, uh, Sandy Crawford. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Josh, what about you? Britney Spears. Oh, okay. Josh is a little younger. He's a little younger. <laughs> I was gonna say a little different generation. That's all good. That's all good. That's still an excellent choice. Creepy if yeah. I were to. Um, <laughs> 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 uh josh if you could add any person's face to mount rushmore who would it be <laughs> <laughs> oh man that's a tough one uh well i i would say that because it it would have to be someone from the united states it would be sam adams oh yeah oh, wow excellent choice i love it excellent choice uh, Scott, what about you? I'm going to go really nerdy here and say Baron von Steuben. Uh, if you don't know who he is, he's got a he's got a statue. He's got a statue on the north side of the White House. He's a very unknown member of history, 
but he was a Prussian and he came in and the uh, U.S. was getting its ass kicked during the Revolutionary War. And he came in and trained them and drilled them into a professional army. Without him, Revolutionary War would not have been won by the U.S. Wow. How have I have I gotta not, look, I gotta do some Wikipedia I'm, magic later and I'm check. It out. wasn't even really a Baron, but that was his name, Baron von Steuben. So apparently, according to some historians, he had somewhat of a seedy past, and that's why he's not really known in the history books. But hmm. it, you know, his effort in, in creating an actual professional army out of uh, the the rebels, uh, the revolutionary state uh, that helped win the Revolutionary War. I love it. Sounds like a character name from Young Frankenstein. Absolutely, right. Baron von Steuben. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 that's a good one well let's uh let's let's do this week's uh notable smokable and as always notable smokables brought to you by ace prime notable smokables or sorry notable cigars notable passion notable purpose so for this week's notable smokable uh garrett why don't you jump on this one first mm, it was an atabay oh yeah that's so, notable i have two i had two of them sitting in my humidor and i've been sitting on them for a while and it's one of those that you're like ah should i yet should i let it sit and i smoked it and i was like i am getting more of these <laughs> and when we went up to ristafari i kept asking everybody is there anywhere i can get atabays around here no the only okay. place i know of in in that area is uh Bigs in Chicago, or in maybe Casa. up down or Casa. Yeah. So, uh, Scott, is there something you smoked recently that kind of caught your attention? Yeah. Um, am I allowed to, to to say more than one? Of course. Yeah. All right. So, uh, the first one is uh, I went and visited a retailer that uh, was recently uh, opened up. Uh, Letter of the law was able to open it up with somewhat of a defiance to from some local restrictions. So I said, God damn it, if you're opening them up, I'm going to be there. So I went and they actually have. So Pete Johnson makes a very specific size of the uh, of the Cabaguan for them. Mm. And it was their house blend of that. And I smoked that. And uh, on the retro hill, I got a flavor that I just really have have not really experienced before. Uh, which was completely new and wonderful to me. So that was that was amazing. Um, and then at that same shop, I was able to find, I haven't been able to find a whole lot of these uh, anymore, which is the uh, La Carême from Crowned Heads. Oh, yes. I found a few of those. I think I bought the rest of what he had in stock, like five of them or something. And, and I had one of those uh, just two days ago. It was perfect weather outside um, on, uh, no, I'm sorry. It was yesterday afternoon. It was perfect weather outside. I went outside after lunch. I had made myself an espresso and just sat there reading in the beautiful sun with this cigar. And uh, so, yeah, those were, those were the two notables for my weekend on Friday and the Sunday smokes. Um, those were uh, really great. Nice. Uh, Josh, what about you? So I recently, just moments ago, smoked an El Politico, which I, I think is a fantastic cigar. <laughs> to, uh, sharing that with everybody. Uh -huh. Besides that, um, I we visited Smoke in Bridgeville, Pennsylvania, Mame Kendall's shop, and had a Sigabon, uh, oh, which yeah. was really cool. And then I also uh, visited a shop in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and got a two seed Habano uh, house cigar for only three bucks mm. and smoked it at little round top at Gettysburg battlefield, which was really good. Nice. You know, and that's, I, I love, I love hearing that because some of these house blends, you guys are great. Uh, if you're in a shop, you're visiting a shop and, and they have a house blend, try it. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of times it'll be a great budget cigar <laughs> yeah. that, that you can, yeah. that you can enjoy for just a few dollars. I would like to say that I have been vindicated here by Coop himself on my cigar choice. Thank you. Thank you, Coop. That's right. That's right. Well, and it's funny because uh, – go ahead, Josh. I was just going to say, to your point, I think that, you know, one of my standard practices whenever I go to a retail shop, like a new retail shop uh, that I haven't visited before, I always will get a tried and true, something that I love smoking no matter what. For me, it's – a Padron or um, the Almafuerta, um, uh, Almafuego. And uh, 
you know, so that I'm always going to get one of those. I have, I rotate between about 10 different uh, cigars and then the house blend. I will always try the house blend and then something that's new to the market. That's more, um, you know, more popular if I read it or, or see it, hear about it in a podcast or, you know, see it in, in, in one of the, the publications, but the house blends for me, um, I was incredibly impressed by Craig Cass and Tinderbox. Mm. He had some of the best house blends there. And I, I, I mean, affordable and just quality smokes. Yeah. yeah Steve, well, Steve Castro at Davidus in Maryland has a lot yeah. of great house blends. His breakfast blend that he does is really great too. Oh, yeah. So it's funny because uh, my notable smokable this week is actually a shout out to Coop as well because for – the last few years, honestly, I've been uh, hearing Coop talk about Saga cigars, and it's been a brand that I've never seen at any shops up here in the Minneapolis area. I've never, I've, I've looked around at some online retailers and found some and thought, well, maybe I'll buy some, and then I never pulled the trigger on buying any. And when I was in Fort Myers, uh, the the shop that I was in, uh, the world famous cigar bar, they had some in there, and I said, finally, I'm gonna try one of these cigars, and I got the Saga Blend Number Seven, and it was a. I, I sat by the canal one morning with a with a uh, cup of coffee and smoked that cigar, and it was so so good. So thank you, Coop, for that recommendation. It's uh, it was a cigar I enjoyed a lot. So that was my uh, notable smokable of the week, and that was notable smokables brought to you by. Ace Prime, improving lives through fine cigars. Visit aceprime.com to learn more. So just some closing remarks uh, for you guys out there watching and listening. Uh, next week on the 22nd, uh, we're going to talk to Eric Bay from a new up-and-coming cigar company called Black Star Line Cigars. Uh, and then we have a, another special, uh, obviously we are, we're always on Monday nights, but we have another special Saturday afternoon show uh, coming up where we're going to get to talk to uh, Jeremiah Mirapfel from the famed Mirapfel Cameroon tobacco family. Uh, and he is uh, coming to us from Europe, obviously. So we're going to do that one on a Saturday afternoon. So it works with his time frame. Uh, and great stuff coming up after that as well. So stay tuned. Mm -hmm. um, so for both of you guys, for Scott and Josh, uh, give the, the viewers a final uh, shout out. Where is the best place to get information and to get involved? Go ahead, Josh. Well, yeah, we'll start with you. I would just say, you know, premiumcigars.org, our main website, and then cigaraction.org. Um, you can get a hold of us. My email and, and phone number is plastered everywhere on both sites. Um, you know, feel free to call if you're a consumer that has questions, if you're a retailer, manufacturer. Um, we're here. We're our greatest asset in the association is our members, um, but also the cigar community at large. And we're here. Uh, to fight for you and we'll continue to do so. Um, and we love hearing from you. So like I mentioned before, I'm going to be on the road. I hope to meet as many people um, in this industry as possible to learn new things, to grow as a, a professional that's representing this um, industry in, at the highest levels. And, um, you know, we, we definitely want feedback, both positive and negative. And uh, we'll try and get out to as many shops as we can. I, I have to give a, a shout out to Cigar Sessions. I did an event with them um, in Delaware recently with Steve Zangle and Los Cayetos. That's why I was uh, smoking one of his, his cigars tonight. Um, it, just the incredible stories. Every time I'm out on the road meeting people, um, it reinforces why I'm doing this, why I've taking this career route and I'm grateful for the opportunity every day. Yeah, 100%. I, you know, um, you know, cigaraction.org is really the best resource. we got a lot of great stuff up there. You can click on a map, see what's going on in your state or neighboring states or states where you might be visiting and that kind of stuff too. And, uh, where you might have family, uh, but really ultimately, uh, just keep smoking, keep enjoying it. And, and, uh, you know, look, if you guys primarily buy online, you know that's great keep doing that it supports the industry but if you have a chance every once in a while swing by your local tobacconist and brick and mortar store if you can 
buy buy a cigar from them, say hi, sit down and smoke and enjoy the the culture, enjoy the people. Um, that that's the lifeblood of this industry. We can't lose that. Um, and and so that's kind of my just keep enjoying it. it just and keep yeah. participating in, in in things like this in cigar coop, uh, you know, in blind man's puff. Just keep keep this culture going. We don't want to lose it. The more momentum we have, the better, the more we're, we're engaged with, with, with what we're doing uh, at all levels of advocacy, but really ultimately at the end of the day, guys, we all just want to be able to relax and have a cigar with our friends, with our family, uh, and, and just have that. And, and we all love it so much. So please just keep leaning into it, keep doing it, keep sharing it. Um, and just, you know, keep, uh, keep, keep the culture going, keep the movement yeah. going. Yeah. So, guys, thank you so much for spending time. This was one of our longer shows, and I appreciate you guys hanging in with us and giving us mm -hmm. a lot of great information, a lot of great stuff to think about and ways that we can all get involved, whatever role we play in the industry. You know, it's it gives us all ways to to get involved and, and stay plugged in. So thank you so much for spending time with us this evening. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. I, I told you we were long-winded and could talk, but you never did throw out the flugelhorn, so I appreciate that very much. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thank you. We really appreciate you guys having us on. I know we're not the most exciting guests, but the, um, it, it's great to be able to get the word out to folks. And so really, thank you very much for, for having us on in this slide. This is great. Oh, yeah, the yeah. Guy, we're an ascot. Next interview, I'll, I'll, I'll bring back the ascot. I love it. Yes. I love it. Uh, guys, I, will not, I will not wear chaps. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, that just kills your next invite. <laughs> <laughs> I will, uh, but I won't stand up. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Uh, I might be wearing chaps right now. You never know. Yeah. <laughs> hey, this is why we're kindred spirits, man. You never know. Uh, guys, hang with us uh, in the green room after we go off the air uh, just for a couple minutes. Uh, for viewers and listeners, as always, guys, we you are the reason we do this. We're so grateful to you for hanging with us. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and obviously, if you weren't able to watch live, thanks for watching after the fact. For the audio listeners on the podcast, thanks so much, as always, for listening. Um, you can find us on howaboutthatcigar.com. You can email Garrett and I directly from there uh, if you have any questions for us. Follow us on social media at HBT Cigar. And until we see you next time, burn cigars, not bridges. See you guys. Thank Thanks. you.